In Yu-Gi-Oh, there are a lot of cards with lore surrounding them or that appear in the anime. And in this video, we'll go over the best cards in the game that just also happen to have stories and lore associated to them. And starting off at number 10, we have Retort. This is a counter trap card that occasionally sees play in the side deck of meta decks because it's an excellent counter to mirror matches, as it allows you to negate the effect and destroy a spell or trap card that you have in your graveyard, and then add a copy of that card back to your hand after you negate your opponents. So, it's a negate that allows you to go plus one, but it's also incredibly situational, and why it's only at the number 10 spot on this list. Now, Retort is surprisingly the end of the storyline about a king who went on a tirade. The story is told through a whole bunch of cards, but the gist of it is, the king started to oppress people, went on a tirade and just kind of threw a fit, abusing his subjects and soldiers, and then the oppressed people eventually started a huge revolution, which failed due to double agents in the crowd. But the soldiers revolted as well, and then he was eventually demoted by the king from Imperial Order, which I guess was a higher level king than him or something, and then after he was deposed he walks the street, having stuff thrown at him by his previous subjects, which is where the artwork of Retort comes in. And at number 9 we have Where Arf Thou. This is a spell card that allows you to search out any level 1 monster from your deck if you control a level 1 monster. This card is used extensively in modern Spyro decks, as they play 3 level 1 monsters pretty heavily, and we'll probably see more play in the future if people adopt the Magician Souls engine. In the artwork for Where Art Thou, it shows a boy putting up posters for his lost dog, and you can see the dog in the background, who is actually the outstanding dog Moran. Although, the boy never actually finds his lost dog, and the dog waited so long that three different possible outcomes happened to him, based on three different cards. First is that he got lost in the dark world and became the Mad Dog of Darkness. Second is that he got converted into a machine and became the Mecha Dog Moran. And third is that he died after waiting for 1000 years and became the Skull Dog Moran. Now, unfortunately, of these three possible outcomes, it's most likely that Skull Dog Moran is the canon ending, as we'll talk about that a little bit more in a different spot in this video. And at number eight, we have Wavering Eyes. This is a quick play spell card which destroys all cards in the pendulum zones and then gains an effect based on the amount of cards destroyed. This card was so good during the pendulum era that it actually got banned for a while, as it allowed you to destroy your opponent's scales while also gaining advantage. As if you destroyed four cards, you got to add another copy of this card from your deck to your hand, you got to banish a card on the field, you got to search out any pendulum monster from your deck, and you got to inflict 500 points of damage to your opponent. So it was a possible 4 card destruction, which lets you go plus 2 in card advantage while also setting up your extra deck. Although, nowadays with pendulums being pretty heavily nerfed, it's no longer banned and hardly sees any competitive play. Now, the artwork on this card is the middle in a story involving two characters, called Sam Bell the Summoner and her older brother, Rise Bell the Summoner. In the background of Rise Bell the Summoner, you can see the Hypno Sister and her familiar, Trans Familiar. In the artwork of Wavering Eyes, you can see them jump Rise Bell and corrupt him, turning him into Rise Bell the Star Adjuster. Then she goes even further beyond and transforms him into Rise Bell the Star Psyker. But then, through the power of friendship or an unwavering bond, his sister is able to undo his corruption and presumably bring him back to normal as Unwavering Bond is the last card in the storyline. And at number 7 we have Mistake. This is a very simple floodgate card that while it's on the field, neither player can add cards from their deck to their hand except by drawing them. And since one of the requirements for a deck to be good is to basically have a whole bunch of search materials, this card does an excellent job at shutting down pretty much every single good deck. And just like all the other cards so far, this good card, which sees competitive play, also tells a little short story. In the story, you can see the card Sangan getting onto the wrong bus. He was trying to take a tour bus to the underworld, which he had taken in the past as you can see him in one of the windows of the bus, and instead accidentally took a ride to the Forbidden Realms. As in the artwork Tour Bus to the Forbidden Realms, you can see Sangan sitting next to the monsters from Tribe Infection Virus, along with a couple of other banned cards in the background or all these cards were banned when this card came out anyway. 
as the Forbidden Realms is an obvious play on words for the Forbidden List, cards that are banned from the current format and not allowed to be played in your deck. Eventually, Sangen gets off the bus and hops into a car with banned spell cards, as it's being driven by one of the imps from Delinquent Duo, and he's being comforted by the angel from Graceful Charity. Although this car gets pulled over and everyone gets arrested as they had a pot of greed in the trunk. He's then placed in jail alongside the Witch of the Black Forest, who was another banned car that has an incredibly similar effect to Sangan, where they both allow you to search monsters from your deck after they're destroyed. Eventually though, Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest had their effects changed and then they were released from the ban list, although there isn't a card showing this. The best we get is Summon Gate, which shows Thousand Eyes Restrict getting released from the extra deck ban list. So we can just assume Sangan and Witch of the Black Forest eventually got out in the same way that Thousand Eyes Restrict did. And at number 6, we have There Can Be Only One. This is a continuous trap card which locks both players from having more than two types of monsters on the field. So if you're playing against a deck that has nothing but zombies or machine types, for example, they're only allowed to play one monster of those types each. And it's a really good floodgate card against a lot of decks, since lots of decks play cards of the exact same type. And in fact, it's one of the more heavily played floodgates in the game currently. And this card also continues the story of Outstanding Dog Moran. You see, after turning into a skeleton, the dog was adopted by the Skull Servant family, as you can see them in the artwork of White Princess and White Prince, taking him on a walk and Monster Rebone, with him running away from Skull Servant. Then in the artwork of There Can Only Be One, the Skull Servant family is going on vacation when they get stopped. And then in the artwork of Quarantine, you can see that the dog has been quarantined off. And uh, that's about it. The story ends here. Although since Skull Servant is a king now, he doesn't have much to worry about, and he'd most likely get his dog back and go on vacation like planned. And at number 5, we have Skill Drain. This is a powerful floodgate card which just negates the effects of all monsters in the field, and can win you the game against a lot of decks, which is why it's currently limited to one copy, because it's a little bit too easy to use for how good of an effect it has. And Skill Drain is showing the battle which takes place between Dark Ruler Hades and this random level 3 vanilla monster called Dark King of the Abyss. You see, the Dark King got demoted by the Dark Ruler, as shown in the card Demotion, so he set up an elaborate ruse in order to get back at him. As shown in the card Hate Buster, he gives him some kind of device which drains his power, as shown in Skill Drain. And then, over the course of three cards, you see him stealing the Dark Ruler's soul. But then, the Dark Ruler is revived thanks to the Plague Spreader zombie virus, and comes back and destroys the Dark King of the Abyss. But then, what do you know? Dark King of the Abyss also revives, as shown in Powerful Rebirth and Reject Reborn, and then uses the soul he captured in order to blast the revived King Hades with the Kamehameha Wave, only to be immediately instigibbed by the Archfiend Emperor, the first Lord of Horror, as shown in the card Call of the Archfiend. Or something like that. Honestly, with a lot of these card artworks lore, you kind of just have to put these pieces together for yourself and figure things out. And at number 4, we have Solemn Strike. This is one of the top 10 most played trap cards in the game, as at the measly cost of 1500 life points, you get a spell speed 3 card which can negate a monster effect and destroy that card, or negate a special summon and destroy the card. Both of these happen in pretty much every deck, so this card is almost always live and has an excellent effect. Now, as for the story of this card, there was a maiden who just got her hands on a whole bunch of forbidden items, and then got a scolding from the guy from Solemn Judgment. Although, after her scolding, she decided to keep on going after forbidden stuff and steals the forbidden scriptures. Although, in the bottom left of the card artwork, you can see that the guy from Solemn Judgment catches her in the act, and that's where Solemn Strike comes into play, as he strikes her down with whatever divine power he has. So then, she becomes the Condemned Maiden, and then gets an upgrade into the Condemned Witch, and tries to go back and fight in Witch's Strike, and is able to strike down the Bearded Fellow, becoming the Condemned Dark Lord, gaining a halo afterwards, which we can assume means she gained his power somewhat. With Condemned Dark Lord being the last card in this series of stories, it seems as if the story will probably continue in the future, but this is where it ends for now. And at number 3, we have Orcus Crescendo. 
This was the Omni Negate counter trap for the Orcus archetype, which saw heavy play because Orcus decks were one of the most played decks in the past year. And what it did was allow you to negate the effect of a card if you controlled an Orcus Link monster, and it had a graveyard effect to add a dark machine monster from your deck or banded zone to your hand. So it was a really good counter trap, and the lore this card depicts is part of the world legacy lore, and is kind of the culmination of one of the last parts of it, and the world legacy lore is super long. So I'm going to summarize the hell out of it to explain exactly what's going on in here. World Legacy lore starts off with a post-apocalyptic world that's overrun by mech knights. In a small remote village, there were three friends and their pet dragon. Avram, who was chosen to save the world, Ib and Ningursu, who are brother and sister, and Imduk, the baby dragon, who follows their group around. One day, the fairy named Lee comes and finds the group and tells them that they are the chosen ones who are meant to find the seven world legacy artifacts, which would help them save the world, and then leads them to the World Chalice. World Chalice then upgrades all of them into more powerful forms, and they head out to find the other world legacy items. Eventually, they come across the world armor, which is overrun by crawlers. During the fight with the crawlers, Ib is captured by the mech knights, so the remaining three chase after her and find them at the World Shield. So the three fight the Mech Knights while the Fairy Lee goes off to rescue Ib. And then, plot twist, turns out Lee was actually evil, and finds Ib and uses the World Chalice in order to fuse themselves together in order to become Nightmare Corruptor Ibli. Ibli then joins the fray and completely destroys all of the Mech Knights and transforms them into the Nightmares. But she's not able to get all of them, as Mech Knight Blue Sky hands off his power source to Avram before he's killed, which transforms him into Mech Knight Avram. Ningursu then tells Mech Knight Avram to go save his sister, while he'll stay behind to fight the remaining six nightmares by himself. Two of which are banned, mind you, and two of the others are some of the most played cards in the game, so, you know, pretty tough accomplishment here. Although Avram is not actually able to defeat Ibli, and right before he's about to be finished off, the dragon Imduck appears and is able to temporarily stop her, by forcing Ib's spirit out of Ibli's fused body. Ib is then able to kill herself with her ghost body in order to stop Lee, and then this is when Ningursu returns, having defeated the six nightmares by himself, which is pretty impressive considering he's a vanilla monster in this form, as his powers were stripped from him when Lee betrayed them, he's shocked to find the body of his dead sister. And then this ends the first chapter of the story, and is when the group parts ways. We're almost to the part with Orcus Crescendo. Ningursu then takes Ib's body to the research lab, which was used to create the Mech Knights, and Avram goes off and finds the Crusadia tribe. While on their journeys, Avram is able to also find the World Crown, while Ningursu is able to find the location of the World Wand and Spear. Avram uses the World Crown in order to transform the Crusadia tribe into stronger forms, as well as randomly one crawler, and Ningursu uses the World Wand in order to power the orchestrated Babel as well as upgrading himself to the Orcus Orchestrator, then turns his sister's corpse into a robot, known as Galatea. Avram and his group of Crusadia go to the tower in order to stop this new person who was building a new line of evil machines. During the battle, the tower exploded, and with six of the World Legacy items coming together for the first time, it spawned the seventh World Legacy item, the World Ark. And with all seven of the World Legacy items combined, they transformed into the Guard Dragons. While all this is happening, Ningursu and Avram are fighting, and Galatea, who was most likely being controlled by the spirit of Lee at this point, absorbs the remaining power of the Tower of Babel and transforms into Orcus Nightmare. As the Orcus Nightmare, she joined the battle and kills Imduk, who dies trying to protect Avram. Then she goes out and absorbs the power of three of the Guard Dragons and transforms into Nightmare Incarnation Eadli. She then summons the ultimate Crawler Monster, and World Legacy Guard Dragon Mardark. Then, they all have one final mega battle, where Imduk's soul combines with some of the remaining Guard Dragons in order to create Guard Dragon Almar Duke, and Ningursu hops onto a metal horse and becomes Dingursu, the Orcist of the Evening Star. And then this is where Orcus Crusendo comes in. Dingursu, after a long battle, presumably, trying to stop his rampaging sister, throws his lance at her and manages to beat her. 
in which case her soul is ripped from her body by a guard dragon, and then she's reincarnated. But that's not the end of the World Chalice story, as after all of this is done and settled, a gigantic Death Star machine comes to the planet from space, and they give all of their powers to Avram so that he can fly into space to fight this machine, where he presumably dies in the battle after a whole bunch of other stuff happens, and leaves the world key to Ib to protect the world from future threats, with Ib becoming Lib, the world key master, wearing the cloak from Ningursu and the scar from Avram, and then Ningursu going off on his own as Mech Knight Orcus Gursu, which is where the World Legacy story ends. For now, they might add more to it in the future, but just know I super skimmed over a lot of the story and there is no official canon series of events, so a lot of these scenes and parts are up for interpretation. And at number two, we have Evenly Matched. Evenly Matched is the most played trap card in the game currently, and is a huge part in why going second decks are viable strategy now, in a game where going first usually gave the best advantage, as this card allows you to activate it from your hand at the end of the battle phase, if you control no cards, and it has the effect where your opponent must banish their own cards face down so that they control the same number of cards as you. So, if you meet the conditions to activate this card from your hand, your opponent will have to banish all but one of their cards, which is basically a full board wipe, with one of the best types of removal, non-targeting, banishing face down, with an action controlled by your opponent. And now, the lore for this card kind of has a long history, like World Legacy lore, so it has to do with Six Samurai lore, although luckily in the Six Samurai lore universe, they have a time skip, so I'll just start there. The story starts off in the card Standoff, where it has Shadow of the Six Samurai Shien challenging the Great Shogun Shien to a battle, as Shadow of the Six Samurai is the only Six Samurai in the game who is both a Six Samurai and a Shien card, and it's heavily implied that he used to be the body double for the Great Shogun, and is probably challenging him for the Shogun's power. Although in the corner, there is Hand of the Six Samurai, waiting to attack the Great Shogun as well. And in the card face-off, you can see that the Great Shogun notices her, and stops her before she gets a chance to backstab him. And then in the card evenly matched, you see them actually fighting one another. And since both cards have the exact same attack power at 2500, they're evenly matched. And we don't really know the outcome of this battle, but one can assume that at least the Great Shogun Shien died, as the card Legendary Secret of the Six Samurai was released afterwards, which is his armor with a ghost inhabiting it. And we don't really have any confirmation on Shadow of the Six Samurai, who could have died as well, or maybe won in the battle, who knows. And at number one, we have Return from the Different Dimension. This card has the effect where you can pay half your life points to special summon as many of your banished monsters as possible but they get banished during the end phase, which doesn't matter because this card is actually just special summon five monsters, which is super good effect and why this card is currently banned. And what do you know? This card is the end of a story for another card called the DD Warrior Lady. The story starts off with the Warrior Lady of the Wasteland fighting the Warrior Digrepher, and then during the fight she gets pulled into the different dimension, which in Yu-Gi-Oh lore is what we refer to as the Banished Zone. While in the different dimension, you can see her being recruited with three other different dimension warriors in DD Recruits. And she's also a DD designator, whatever that means. Anyways, also in the different dimension is Warrior Digrepher, who goes through all kinds of changes in the different dimension, and there's even a card which depicts the two different versions of the Warrior Digrepher meeting in the different dimension. And Warrior Digrepher and DD Warrior Lady have another fight, and at one point he tries to seduce her, and then she fights another version of him, probably indicating that she has been successful in all of the fights against him. And then eventually she finds the Different Dimension Gate, and is able to go home as shown in the card, Return from the Different Dimension, along with four other monsters, one of them also being a Different Dimension Warrior. Now, there's lots of cards which depict events happening in the Different Dimension, and DD Warrior Lady is just one of its many inhabitants. And it just so happens that two of the cards depicting events from the different dimension are currently banned, with the other one being Dimension Fusion, which probably shows the early stages of return from the different dimension before they actually break free. 
Yu-Gi-Oh! has made a lot of cards over the years, with lots of them having stories attached to them. They're either explained in the Master's Guides, which are books, the Dual Terminal arcade game, or inferred over a bunch of different cards. So on today's list, we're going to go over 10 more storylines of different cards in the game. Starting us off at number 10, we have Inpachi, which is definitely one of the older cards on our list. Inpachi is a normal level 4 earth machine monster with 1600 attack and 1900 defense, and has the flavor text of a log that attacks lost travelers in the forest. Originally a big tree, it was cut down and possessed by a wicked spirit. So Inpachi's story starts with an old forest in the middle of nowhere, where Inpachi, a spirit of a tree, resides. And as the tale goes, humans show up and start settling in, which means deforestation of the nearby forest. And what would happen is that people would mark the trees as numbers depending on their quote-unquote size and strength. And Inpachi was marked with number 18. Don't ask me how they measure the strength of a tree, because I don't really have any clue. So, when the deforestation started, Inpachi had to watch all of his fellow trees get cut down and destroyed. This didn't sit too well with him, as you could probably imagine. So, in a desperate attempt for revenge after it got cut down, Inpachi summoned an unnamed evil spirit that took over his will for revenge. And after he was cut down, Inpachi rose up and took his revenge on the people who cut down his forest. But that was just the first of his many victims. On his path of revenge against all those who reside in the forest, he crossed paths with quite the unlikely duo, a giant lizard and a captain. So a fierce battle broke out between Inpachi, Gaga Gigo, and the Marauding Captain. And if you could imagine, a tree golem facing down a giant lizard and a phenomenal swordsman, it didn't turn out too well for Inpachi. The final blow was dealt to Inpachi by Marauding Captain as seen with the card Double Attack. But this isn't the end of Inpachi, as he gets back up after the Captain and Gaga Gigo leave the wooden golem. Venturing further into the forest, he runs into Chopman, the Desperate Outlaw. And like the Captain and Gaga Gigo, a fight breaks out. This time with his opponent being a fire user, and well, fire against wood, it never really goes well. Which is what we see in the card artwork for Backfire. But still fueled by revenge, Inpachi rose again as he burned, turning himself into Blazing Inpachi. This version of Inpachi is a fire pyronor monster with 1850 attack and zero defense points. The Blazing Wood Golem still continues through the forest and encounters a familiar foe. Or foes in this case. Blazing Inpachi has a rematch with Marauding Captain and Gagagigo while they're fighting the Invader of Darkness. Now with Inpachi being ablaze, he might stand a chance. Their fight is shown in the cards United Front and Two Man Cell Battle. But unfortunately for Inpachi, he loses once more and the fire finally consumes him and Inpachi now becomes Charcoal Inpachi, a charred corpse. A level 1 Pyrodora monster with 100 attack and 2100 defense. Despite Inpachi's best efforts to get revenge for his fellow trees of the force, his lust for revenge took things too far. But this isn't the true end for Inpachi as an evil scientist Kozaki took what was left of Impachi for his own use to create Woodborg Impachi, a mechanized robot version of Impachi to continue his vengeance spree. But again, like when the upgrade, it didn't help as he lost again, as shown in Kickfire. And that concludes the story of Impachi. From a simple tree spirit that wanted to only seek revenge for his forest getting destroyed, to a possessed tree spirit that refuses to let go for one reason or another. Impachi is only number 10 because Impachi itself is pretty weak in all of its forms. Unlike the next one on this list that grows into quite the monster. And at number 9, we have Petit Dragon, a level 2 normal monster that has the win attribute and is dragon type. With a pretty poor stat line of 600 attack and 700 defense, and the flavor text that reads, a very small dragon known for its vicious attacks. It doesn't seem like the flavor text is true with the low attack points. But don't worry, the story of Petit Dragon has the dragon rise to power. So let's get started. So, Petit Dragon, as I mentioned, is pretty bad in terms of stats, but the dragon was motivated to get stronger. And one day, Petit Dragon encountered Worm, the Wind Charmer, and both of them shared the same goal of growing in strength. And after a long training arc, they both part ways with a new goal for Petit Dragon, to breathe fire like other dragons. Hearing a legend that eating a mythical plant called Firegrass would allow such a feat, Petit Dragon set off on its quest, venturing through peerless lanes and eventually racing a volcano where the firegrass was said to grow. But things didn't turn out well for our small dragon. Rather than let Petit Dragon breathe fire, the Firegrass consumed Petit Dragon and transformed it into Dark Fire Dragon. Eventually, seeking more power, Petit Dragon, now Dark Fire Dragon, went in search of it and eventually found some allies. Dark Fire Dragon came across four other dragons that shared the same goal of growing stronger. Each of these dragons represented the fundamental attributes of the world. Earth and wind, water and dark, and so on and so on. They combined their powers to become the Five-Headed Dragon. Petit Dragon achieved its search for power and became one of the strongest monsters in Yolore. lore as there aren't any cards that have a higher attack point value that isn't a question mark. But with all that power, the five-headed dragon couldn't rest as there was one last foe in the way, the Dragon Master Knight. There was a massive clash between the two big monsters. Eventually, five-headed dragon was defeated by the Dragon Master Knight. And in its loss, the dragon separated and the Dragon Master Knight sealed the dragons into different items. A petite dragon was sealed into a blade, which became Salamandra. 
Nobody could tame the power of the Sil Dragon of the Blade until the Flame Swordsman came across the Blade. The Swordsman claimed the Darkfire Dragon, and now they are an unstoppable force. Or at least the theories online like to tell. Most of the theories don't account for Petit's Dragon's appearance in the Law of the Normal cards, or mention Ranru or Awaken of the Possessed, Rasa Ranru, two evolved forms that came out with a new Charmer support. Also, in case you're wondering why it battles the Dragon Master Knight as the Five-Headed Dragon, since there's no card artwork that actually shows this, well, that's just an anime rinse. And following the trends of the Companions of the Elemental Charmers, next up is Gaga Gigo, a level 4 normal water reptile monster with 1850 attack and 1000 defense. Unlike the previously mentioned Petty Dragon, Gaga Gigo is evolved from one of the Charmer Companions, Gigabyte. And that's where the story starts, with Gigabyte and Iria the Water Charmer. Gigabyte was quite the small fry and was constantly being hunted. One day, Gigabyte was being attacked by some evil plants, and rather than Gigabyte's story ending right then and there, Iria saved Gigabyte from the plants. And after being saved, Gigabyte decided to join Aria on her quest for strength. And after some time, like a Pokemon, Gigabyte evolved into Gaga Gigo. And after its evolution, Gigabyte and Iria parted ways, and that's where the story of Gaga Gigo truly begins. Gaga Gigo went on a quest to get stronger. After some time traveling and training, Gaga Gigo runs into Goblin Attack Force. And for some reason, the Goblin Attack Force chooses the worst place to fight on, that being an icy lake. And Gaga Gigo, being quite the skilled skater, makes quick work of them. In a forest, Gekigo comes across a military camp, and Captain is cooking up quite the meal. Hungry after his defeat of the Goblin Attack Force, Gekigo tried to approach the camp for a snack. And after stealing some, freed the brave wanderer who was really looking forward to the stew took on the thief in a fight. The fight got so intense that a portal to a different dimension opened up. Although there is official reason as to why the dimensional prison opened, but my theory is that it was an attempt at an assassination of Freed by the Invader of Darkness, as there was a big rivalry between the two, which we'll get into in a second. Gagagigo found himself wandering a graveyard in this different dimension, but eventually Gagagigo ran into the person who sent him there, the Invader of Darkness. And impressed with the strength of Gagagigo, he became a general in Invader of Darkness' army. In their conquest, Gagagigo got betrayed and ended up teaming back up with the Marauding Captain against both Blazing and Pachi and Invader of Darkness. In the fight, Gagagigo would take on a blast from the Riding Captain, Absolute End, allowing the Captain to defeat the Invader of Darkness, or at least for the moment. In the aftermath, like what happened with Impachi, Kozaki took what remained of Gagagigo. Kozaki turned Gagagigo into an evil, cybernetically enhanced creature named Giga Gagagigo. After his transformation, he got sent as far away from Kozaki's lab as possible, through both a compulsory evacuation device and a monster gate. And when he got to his new area, he went and started picking some fights. The first fight he picked was the infamously deadly snake, a Venom Cobra. And after his fight against the Cobra, he continued and set his sights on a familiar face, Free the Brave Wanderer. But the fight didn't turn out well for Giga Gaga Gigo, and his enhancements went haywire and broke off, turning him into Go Giga Gaga Gigo. In this new, equally crazed form, he continued his revenge spree once more. He then set his eyes on Freed the Matchless General once more, but was stopped by his old companion, Marauding Captain. Appealing to the being he once called friend, Marauding Captain brought Go Giga Gaga Gigo back to his senses, which purified his soul into Gaga Gigo the Risen a vanilla rank 4 Xyz monster with the same stat line, but the story doesn't end there. After they part ways, Gagagigo is confronted by another Xyz monster, Swordbreaker. And in this confrontation, using Xyz coat, Swordbreaker stole all of the Xyz materials of Gagagigo the Risen as seen in Overlay Capture. And unfortunately, this is where we see the end of Gagagigo for now. Next up is the most simple of cards on our list, Skull Servant. A level 1 normal zombie monster with 300 attack and 200 defense with a flavor text, a skeletal ghost that isn't strong but can mean trouble in large numbers. And prior to 2014, Skull Servant was essentially alone. But when Master Rule 3 came out, not only did his story get fleshed out more, but he became part of a big family, which led to the White Archetype's creation. Our story starts with the fight between rulers of what essentially is the underworld of Yu-Gi-Oh. There was Dark Ruler Hades and the Dark King of the Abyss. And rather than fight head-on, they each had armies of followers fight for their sake as Hades used an army of reanimated skeletons. In the endless fighting between the two, one of the skeletons would sneak off, wanting to rest by a tree. Eventually, after some time and a graveyard was built over the top of the forest, Skull Servant's rest would be interrupted and he would be reawoken by Spirit Caller. But rather than awakening just our main character, she awakened a trio of Skull Servants. This didn't bode well for the Spirit Caller and something went wrong, and there was a bit of a mishap at the resting place. And for some reason, the universe felt bad for our Skull Servant, so it decided to give the Skull Servant a new chance at life. With this new chance, he rose up and vowed to be king. Now, slightly shifting the story to Outstanding Dog Marin, which I already talked about in another video. But long story short, Marin got left waiting for way too long and became Skull Dog Marin. Eventually, Skull Dog would take a bite off of our King of Skull Servants. Amusing the king, the two became inseparable best friends. After some time, the King of Skull Servants would encounter more whites that had been awakened and adopt them into his family. The family grew in size and now was made up of his wife, white prince, white princess, and white mare. 
The family has their own fun adventures and even learn how to play Yu-Gi-Oh, which might be fourth wall breaking. I'm not too sure. But at one point, the king wants to go on vacation to the overworld with his family, but gets stopped and checked. But eventually, they make it through and have quite the picnic and some nice roasted potatoes. And that's the last we hear of the king. But it's a fitting end, going from nothing to a king to start a family and then enjoying a nice roasted potato. And at number 6, we have the Goblin Attack Force, which is a level 4 Earth Attribute Warrior Monster with a surprising 2300 attack and no defense. It is the effect that if it attacks, the monster changes its defense position until the end of the next turn. With one of the highest attack point values a level 4 monster can have, outside of a few exceptions of 2400 attacks, the negative effect isn't too surprising. According to the lore, the low defense point value is because the goblins tire themselves out after attacking and fall asleep. Although there isn't much of a coherent story with the attack force, as they typically are the butt of jokes, as they're either attacked or get hurt pretty badly from other card effects. Some of the most common examples of this are non-spellcasting area, where the attack force try to attack the Gemini Elves and it backfires pretty strongly, or in Micro Ray, where they get shrunk. But it doesn't stop there, as it seems they can't really escape getting into some rough situations, like Earthquake or Hammer Shot. The worst scenario is when they find themselves in Zombie World in front of the Soul Absorbing Bone Tower, and promptly have their soul sucked out of them. How they made it out of there, I have no idea. But I think that was the last straw, as in the card art of Token Thanksgiving, you can see the attack force handing out scapegoats as they shedded their armor. I think it's a well-earned rest and a conclusion to the misfortune, kind of like the Skull Servants. Next up is the ragtag bandit group called the Dark Scorpions. This is essentially a bandit group that has five members that are all monsters that have the effects that when you deal damage to your opponent, you get to choose one of two effects. So let's dive into each member and then their story. First is Check the Yellow, who can either return a card to the hand or look at the top card of your opponent's deck and keep it at the top or send it to the bottom of their deck. Next is Cliff the Trap Remover, that can destroy one spell trapper on the field or mill two cards from your opponent's deck to the graveyard. Then there's Gorg the Strong, that can return an opponent's monster to the top of their deck or mill one off your opponent's deck. Next is Mine the Thorn, which can search another Dark Scorpion from your deck or graveyard. Last, and the leader, is Don Zalug, which is infamously known for its first effect to discard a random card from your opponent's hand, or Mill 2. Don Zalug's effect was notoriously abused back in the early days of the game, as that effect was very good and not that hard to get off, and it was even limited for a bit for being so strong. Each member has their own quirks and specialties. Don Zalug is flexible and is great at escaping traps. Cliff is great at removing and disarming traps, and Chick is brave, I guess. The timidity artwork shows him being brave and venturing into a tomb despite being terrified. And rather than have a super in-depth story, there's just a few cards that show off their exploits. Their first big score was against the Upstart Goblin, and the only other artwork that really shows off the Dark Scorpions is Mustard of the Dark Scorpions, which apparently, according to the lore, explains that they love striking poses and doing group poses after every meeting. Next up is the Icon of the Warrior type, Marauding Captain, a level 3 Earth Warrior monster that has two effects. A taunting one where your opponent has to target Marauding Captain first for attacks, and then the other, more prominent effect, to special summon one level 4 lower monster from your hand when it's normal summon. His service as a captain started in the army of Freed the Matchless General as his second in command and personal chef, and in their many conflicts, they tend to run into previously mentioned Goblin Attack Force and get into several other conflicts. The captain also ran into the first iteration of Impachi, but Impachi was dealt with pretty swiftly in double attack. Eventually, Marauding Captain gets exiled by the army. To find his way back, he decided to take on some other champions, and the first of which was Despair from the Dark which we can see in the card Staunch Defender. Continuing, he found himself in a wasteland and not alone, with a new ally, Warrior Lady of the Wasteland, and they made a pretty strong team. Taking on the Terror King Archivine, but it didn't turn out well for the captain, as he got pretty badly wounded, losing two of his swords. Somehow surviving, he went back to his mission. Continuing his journey, he runs into Gagagigo, and together, they next face the foe that was the Invader of Darkness, a longtime enemy of his superior, Freed. And in their famously known fight, Gagagigo took a blast with the captain, allowing him to deal the final blow to the Invader of Darkness. And this is where the captain returns to Freed as a champion, with reinforcements of the army. And again, this is where the ending of Gagagigo's story comes into play, where the captain essentially knocks some sense back into Gagagigo with memory of an adversary, which helps him become Gagagigo the Risen. And at number 3, we have a story of one of the newer archetypes, the Sky Strikers. The main monster and main character of the story is Sky Striker Ace, Ray a level 4 dark warrior monster that can attribute itself to special summon one Sky Striker extra deck monster, and while in the graveyard, you can special summon Rave and another Sky Striker link monster leaves the field. This effect is pretty cool since the Sky Striker link monsters are all Sky Striker Ray and different mechanized armor sets for different scenarios, but we'll get into that in just a second. So the story of Ray is that of one of the Sky Striker armor suits, which are military technology to essentially make a one-man army, and Ray is the lead of this with her blade, the Sky Striker. She has four different sets of Sky Striker Ace armor, and puts them on as she goes through special gates. So let's take a look at the four modes of the Sky Striker Ace armor. There's Kagari, which lets her wield eight different blades that allow an endless onslaught of slashes. There's Shizuku, which is a defensive armor, which creates barriers. Next is Kaina, which is a specialized for close combat with four giant fists. 
and last is Hayate, which was made for long-range combat with her giant railgun. Each of the suits has an ultimate move, called Maneuvers, which overclock the suits for powerful and devastating attacks. On top of her Sky Striker Ace armor, Rei has a bunch of other tools to help her on her assignments that all stem from her floating fortress, the Sky Striker Mecha Armory Hercules Base. Her main additional tools are the Eagle Booster, the Widow Anchor, Shark Cannon, and Hornet Drones. During the mission, Rei saw another girl on the battlefield who looked like a copy of her, but more sinister. Turns out the enemy managed to create their own version of the Sky Striker mechs, and their fight was pretty toe-to-toe -to -toe at first, but Rose would summon her own Sky Striker armor called Zeke. Then, in a desperate attempt for victory, Rei used the ultimate move of the Kagari armor at the cost of the destruction of her beloved armor. But, in victory, she held the defeated Rose to find a new enemy looming over the horizon. And that's when the story ends, with the two facing off against this new threat. Bo potentially new support for the archetype coming out soon, and of course the manga they created, the story will go on. And although Sky Strikers are a good archetype, the next card on this list were a bit stronger during their time. Next are the Tier 0 Spiral Monsters, and our main character in the story is Spiral Super Agent, a level 4 Earth Warrior monster that has the effect that while in your hand, you can declare one card type, reveal the top card of your opponent's deck, and if it matches a declaration, you can Special Summon Super Agent. Then, if it's Special Summoned by a Spiral card, which yes, its effect counts as one, you can destroy one spell trap card your opponent controls. But that's not why the Spiral cards were good. It was due to their amazingly high consistency, got several negates on board, and could out multiple monsters with spell speed to destruction during your opponent's turn. But this was back in 2017, so times have changed. Regardless, it's no easy feat being a tier 0 deck at any point in time. But now to the story. Essentially, Spirals is a spy organization. Working out of their command center, they have a small team of spies that complete several missions to keep the peace. There are five main members of the Spiral team. First, as we mentioned, was Super Agent. Then there's Spiral Tough, which is the muscle of the team. Quick Fix and Master Plan are both back-end support, where Quick Fix creates gadgets and tools for the agents to use in the field, while Master Plan is the commanding officer, giving out missions and keeping the organization afloat. Last but not least is Spiral Sleeper, the former mentor and partner of Spiral Super Agent. When the story of the Spiral card starts out, Sleeper is actually MIA, or missing in action, as he was sent to an enemy nation but never returned. After finding out where Sleeper was being held captive, all agents were called back for a rescue mission. Quick Fix built some new gadgets and tools to help the agents with spiral gear. Specifically, there was a drone, a pretty speedy car, a utility wire, and more. On their mission, they're also accompanied by other agents, Spy Gal Misty and the undercover resort staff. On their way to rescue Sleeper, they had to fight through a ton of enemies, and this time, they went with a full-on assault. The team then needed to extract some key information regarding the specific whereabouts of Sleeper, so Super Agent needed to recapture the information. And with the interrogation, they found their way to Sleeper, who was brainwashed by the enemy nation. So breaking him out and getting him back to normal was a bit of a challenge. But Quick Fix had a plan for that. See, he also prepared for this with some gear. With the power of a power gauntlet and a power suit, they managed to free Sleeper and the dynamic duo Sleeper and Super Agent reunited once more. Now, the last card on the list is a little on the unknown side, where not a lot of people know that it exists or what it does. And this, of course, is the Pot of Greed, which can let you draw two cards from your deck. And all jokes aside, there's some pretty interesting lore for a fan favorite spell card. So the Pot of Greed is actually home to a couple of spirits. The main two that we know of so far are the Spirit of the Pot of Greed, which is an angel that likes to visit the pot, and the Avatar of the Pot. The presence of these spirits in the pot further accentuate the greediness of the pot to the point where its depths are endless, like a vacuum as shown in Panic Shuffle. This vacuum is so strong that even through the nose of the Pot of Greed, it can suck loot in. What makes Pot of Greed so interesting, however, is what happens after you reach into the pot. According to the lore of Master Guy 2, the pot explodes once you retrieve something from inside of it, and the explosion can actually kill you by shock. This made Pot of Greed in the lore world of Yu-Gi-Oh! a banned object, which you can see in Mistaken Arrest, alongside other well-known banned cards like Graceful Charity or Sangan. What's even more interesting is the one person who survived the Pot of Greed, the Upstart Goblin. The Upstart Goblin started out as a real estate goblin who amassed quite the fortune. Eventually, there was a big market crash, which didn't turn out well for him, as he lost everything. But once he was down, he got kicked again, as the Black Scorpion Gang robbed him what little he had left. Having nothing, he had to beg on the streets for anything. But, learning from his past mistakes, and with the spark of inspiration from the Dark Scorpions who robbed him, he stole both a jar of greed from a supply cart walking by, and the pot of greed. He then tried to sell the stolen goods, but this didn't go too well as he got fined, as the handles of both the pot and jar fell off as you can see in the artwork of fine. The upstart goblin didn't have enough money and got sent to prison. Once released, he gave up his dreams and had a fresh start working as a mass production factory for Moki Mokis. But there wasn't just one pot of greed, as the upstart goblin found another in the factory, and like before, he sold it to a pot merchant. And although it's not stated, this gets him to quit his job at the factory and is now a housekeeper. In his housekeeping duties, he has to do some gardening. And while cutting the grass, he runs into a sinister serpent, and he somehow managed to capture the serpent in a pot of greed. Looking to sell both the pot once more and the sinister serpent inside, the serpent had a bit of revenge and attacked him at the market. And in the attack, the pot of greed broke into two pieces. 
one of which became the Shard of Greed, and the other became Jackpot 7. And unfortunately, that's all we know right now for the story of the Pot of Greed. Although I'm kind of glad there isn't more story, as that means there will be more cards like the Pot of Greed. Regardless, it's nice that Konami gave a bit of lore to one of the most iconic cards in the game. On today's episode of the Unknown Side of Yu-Gi-Oh!, we're going to be changing things up a bit and talk about the lore of one of the most popular archetypes currently in Yu-Gi-Oh!, Fallen of Albaz. Now, this monster's lore stretches across eight different archetypes along its story. As a rough overview, here are the involved archetypes in no particular order. Spriggins, Dogmatica, Sword Soul, Despia, Ice Jades, Therions, Tribigade, and Sprites. So our story starts off with an official passage from V-Jump, which is a magazine offshoot of Shonen Jump that Konami likes to publish info about Yu-Gi-Oh's new promos, releases, and occasional lore. And rather than go through the entire text, here's a quick summary. The entire story of the Fallen of Albaz takes place in a continent called the Isolated Land. And inside this land, there are these holes that randomly show up and are essentially portals to different parts of the continent. And the holes can sometimes eat up civilizations or drop off powerful relics. And that's about all the context we get before jumping in. And before we go into the full story, we're going to go over some of the characters of the groups that inhabit the isolated land so our story makes some form of sense. First is the Dogmatica. Essentially, they are a nation built on the Dogmatica religion and their holy weapons. At the head of the religion is Dogmatica Maximus. He's the head priest and grants his followers a stigmatica through the holy relic that is Dogmatica Nexus. The stigmaticas are marks that give supernatural powers to whoever has one. There is also Dogmatica Flirtilis, the knighted, and her underling Dogmatica Ecclesia, the virtuous. Flirtilis is the head knight of the Dogmatica army and their strongest warrior, loyal to Maximus. Ecclesia is, as previously mentioned, considered the child of miracles, as she has a stigmatica on her forehead, which is the best place to have one. In terms of in-game, the Dogmatica monsters are light spellcaster monsters that are an anti-extra deck archetype. The level 4 monsters of the archetype, Dogmatica Aiden, the Enlightened, Dogmatica Ecclesia, the Virtuous, and Dogmatica Theo, the Iron Punch, can all special summon themselves if there's an extract monster in the field, and can't be destroyed by a battle by an extract monster. The stronger monsters of the archetype include the previously mentioned Maximus, Nexus, and Flirtilis, which all have unique effects. Flirtilis lets other Dogmatica monsters gain attack points when they battle, and can negate an effect when she's summoned while you control another Dogmatica monster. Maximus can special summon itself by banishing an extra deck monster from your graveyard, and can foolishly burial other extra deck monsters. Dogmatica Nexus, which is arguably the most offensive of the Dogmatica cards, can destroy all of your opponent's special summon monsters at the start of the damage step if it's battling a special summoned monster. Next are the Tribes of the Beastmen, which are humanoids with animalistic features. There are tribes of beasts, beast warriors, and winged beasts, and there is a constant conflict between the tribes for resources, which leads to quite the nasty cycle of vengeance. And in an interesting turn of events, the main three tribes each exile a member for one reason or another. Rugal is exiled for being a Kingslayer. Frigid was exiled for being a thieving cat. But in the Japanese translations, she was a homewrecker, which is a lot more intense. And last was Shirai, who was exiled for being wingless. They each cross paths during their exiles, and believe it or not, they team up to form the Tri Brigade. As an archetype, the Tri Brigade monsters are a combination of Beast, Beast Warrior, and Winged Beast monsters that focus on Link summoning through their banishing. There are a lot of Tri Brigade cards, but we're going to be focusing on the lore relevant ones. Starting with Kit, who's a level 2 Beast monster that has the archetypal effect to banish a number of Beast, Beast Warrior, and Winged Beast monsters from your graveyard to special summon a Beast, Beast Warrior, or Winged Beast Link monster from your deck whose link rating is equal to the amount of monsters banished. Then, if Kid is sent to the graveyard, you can send another Tribrigade monster from your deck to the graveyard. Next is Tribrigade Bear Brom, the Rampant Rampager. That's a Link 2 monster that has two effects. First is to discard two cards and special summon a banished level 4 or lower beast, beast warrior, or winged beast monster. And the second is that if Bear Brom hits the graveyard, you can add a Tribrigade Spell or Trap card from your deck to your hand, and move a card from your hand to the bottom of your deck. Last but not least is the main boss monster of the Tribrigades, Shiraig. This Link 4 can banish a card in the field when a Beast, Beast Warrior, or Winged Beast monster is special summoned, and when it's sent to the graveyard, you can add a Beast, Beast Warrior, or Winged Beast monster from your deck to your hand. Pretty simple, but effective. Now, outside of the Dogmatica, there are a bunch of others that inhabit the isolated land. Notably, there are the Therions, the Sword Souls, and the Ice Jades. The Therions aren't technically native to the lands, but had shown up on their spaceship and crashed when they were teleported to a volcano via a hole. This area that they settle in is called the Land of Iron and Steel, marked by a great tower over a volcano, which is actually their spaceship. The spaceship is still, I believe barely, functional as it's being powered by the magma from the volcano where they landed. And the AI of the spaceship developed quite a fiery personality that also loves combat, which will come back and make sense later. So, our story starts in the northern part of the isolated land in the nation of Dogmatica, but not with the people of Dogmatica. Rather, with the Tri Brigade, a group of three exiled members of the Beastmen tribes who are on a mission to free some captured tribe members that have been taken hostage. And the mission doesn't go too well planned, and stealth no longer becomes an option. So a big fight breaks out between Dogmatic and the Tri Brigade. As the fighting occurs, a hole appears in the sky and a dragon falls through the hole. And the Titanic clad the Ash Dragon joins the battle. As menacing as Titanic clad is, the dragon was quickly disposed of by none other than the best fighter Dogmatica's Flirtilis. After Titanic clad's defeat, its body dissipates and fades away, revealing a young boy in our main character, the Fallen of Albats. 
Ecclesia then goes down to finish the job, but rather than end him, Ecclesia realizes the boy is just lost, afraid, and has no memory of what happened. So she disobeys her orders and helps him. After her defiance, the Tri Brigade arrive on the scene. On one side, there's the Tri Brigade who sympathize and want to help the boy, while the Dogmatic are on the other side who wish to destroy the heretic. In the middle is Ecclesia who wants to find a middle ground, but this was to no avail and Dogmatica Ashian tortures her and then exiles her. Ecclesia passes out from the damage, and in anger, the Fallen of Albez transforms into Begran the Glory Dragon. And alongside the Tri Brigade, they manage to escape the Dogmatica nation. After escaping Dogmatica territory, the group makes it to the Tri Brigade's base of operations. Here, Shirai, the leader of the Tri Brigade, explains that they will be hunted by the Dogmatica nation, and they should seek help from the Spriggans who live in the Great Sand Sea Desert, specifically from Frigid's younger sister, Kit. Before Ecclesia and Fallen of Abbas set off, Shiraig makes them honorary members of the Tri Brigade, giving the boy a pet mechanized bird, Mercurier, one of the many small birds seen in Shiraig's artwork. As the two travel the desert, they become really close friends. The Spriggans notice the two new faces in their territory and assume they're their enemies. The two are captured and brought to the Spriggans' base of operations, but suddenly Kent recognizes Mercurier and everything is cleared up. Turns out the Spriggans are gifted mechanical pirates. In game, they're an archetype of fire machine monsters that revolve around cheating out their Xyz boss monsters, Spriggan ship Exablower, and using the Spriggans as materials that are easy to recycle back to Exablower. Most of the Spriggan monsters have the archetype effect to attach themselves to a Spriggan's Xyz monster as a material from either their hand, field, or graveyard. Lore-wise, the crew's main members are Spriggan's Rocky, which can recur as a Spriggan's field spell or any Spriggan's monster on summon. There's a Spriggan's Pedor, who contributes itself to special summon another Spriggan's monster from your graveyard. And then there's the captain of the Spriggans, Sargas, who's a level 8 Spriggans monster that has the archetypal effect, but also a quick effect to detach one material from one of your Xyz monsters and destroy one card in the field during your opponent's turn. And if Captain Sargas himself is used as a material, the Xyz monster gains 500 attack. Last but not least is Spriggans Kit, who shares the Spriggans name, but her effect has nothing to do with the archetype. Rather, she special summons herself from the hand if you control a fusion monster that mentions Fallen of Albaz, and when she special summoned, you can add a branded Speller Trap to your hand. Back to the story, where the Spriggans are initiating Albaz and Ecclesia before considering them allies. So they go on a bunch of different trials and challenges, such as treasure hunting and hunting down holes. The holes have been pretty fortunate for the Spriggans, as the hole typically sends out industrial materials or technology to help them develop their technology, like their Sprint, the Iron Dash Dragon. After the trials, the group finds quite the hidden treasure, so they throw a big party and Ecclesia finds the skull of a desert serpent and takes quite a liking to it. All while this is happening, things are stirring up in the Dogmatica. Flirtalus, alongside Aiden and Theo, all escape the Dogmatica to search for Ecclesia as they sense the corruption from within the nation. And they left at the perfect time, as Maximus first anoints a new saint in Dogmatica Genesis. With a new saint, Maximus' plan is finally ready. He raises his hands to the sky and starts an accursed ancient ritual, and he draws a corrupted power from a hole that spans over the whole of Dogmatica. With this ritual, all the citizens of Dogmatica have their stigmaticas opened and corrupted them, turning them into despians. The saints are no exceptions either, as everyone in Dogmatica changes. Dogmatica Nexus becomes Despian Proskinian. Dogmatica Ashian becomes Ad Libitimo Despia. Flirtless's sacred armor becomes possessed, becoming the White Knight of Dogmatica, and then further turn into Despian Quiritius. Lastly, Maximus receives the last of the corruption and turns himself into Dramaturge of Despia. This ritual is felt all over the continent, and everyone is affected. With regards to Ecclesia and Albaz, they get into quite the predicament. See, the ritual wakes a long, dormant serpent in the desert, but that isn't the only problem. Albaz loses control and turns into Albion the Branded Dragon. Seeing this massive serpent that's heading towards them, Albion charges towards the enemy, while Kit heads to fight in her new creation, the Bear Bro Mech Suit. In the midst of their fighting, the serpent gets struck down by a flash of lightning, and it seemed like nobody knew where the strike came from. When everyone grouped back up, nobody could have guessed who took down the serpent. It was Flirtilus, Aiden, and Theo. The trio went on quite the journey after their departure from Dogmatica to search for Ecclesia. Rather than heading to the desert, they went to a sacred mountain range which was said to host powerful fighters, Mount Sword Soul. And begging for the aid of the Grand Master, the Sword Soul clan decided to help them. With the aid of the Ice Jades, the Stigmaticas of Theo, Flirtilus, and Aiden were removed and sealed. With their Stigmaticas removed, they didn't succumb to the corruption of Maximus and got quite the power up. Aiden and Theo teaming up to form the Golden Sword Soul, and Flirtilus without her armor being the Iris Sword Soul respectively. Although you might be asking why the Ice Jades are on good turns with the Sword Souls. See, the Sword Souls aren't alone on Mount Sword Soul. They are more guardians of the Sword Soul's sacred summit, and their weapons are extensions of their soul. I know, who would have guessed it by their name alone? Their weapons are provided by what they guard, the Ice Jades. Because at the center of the sacred summit is the Mother Enion Cradle, a living reservoir of water that creates and protects the Sword Soul peaks. This cradle holds the source of the Ice Jade's life, so suffice to say, it's pretty important that it stays protected. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the two groups. The Sword Souls guard the cradle, and the Ice Jades take care of the Sword Souls. But before we continue, let's quickly talk about the two archetypes. The Sword Soul monsters are worm-type monsters that focus on synchro summoning, 
Most of the main deck Swordsword monsters on summon can bring out tokens that create a tuner, which allows them to consistently and efficiently synchro summon. There are five key members of the Swordsword archetype. Starting with Moye, which on summon you can reveal another Swordsword card and special summon a tuner token, and when it's used for a synchro summon you can draw one card. And then there's Sword Soul of Taya, which can banish another Sword Soul card from your graveyard to summon a token, and when it's used for a Synchro Summon, you can foolish another Sword Soul or Worm Monster. Next is Long Yon, which is level 6, unlike Taya or Moye, and you can discard a Sword Soul card or Worm Monster to special summon itself and its token. Then if it's used for a Synchro Summon, you can deal 1200 damage to your opponent. And now are the leaders of the Sword Souls, or their Synchro Boss Monsters. There's Sword Soul Grandmaster Chizou, which is level 8, and on Synchro Summon can search, and as a quick effect, can banish a Sword Soul or Worm Monster to negate a monster's effect for a turn. And at the peak of Mount Sword Soul is the Supreme Sovereign Changing, a level 10 synchro monster with three different effects. First is that it gains 100 attack and defense points while your opponent's monsters lose that many points per banished cards. Then if it would be destroyed by a card effect, you can banish another card from your graveyard instead. And last, if a card is banished, you can banish one card from your opponent's field and graveyard. In terms of the Ice Jades, they are a much more defensive archetype that focuses on controlling your opponent with negates and attack point reduction, while also recycling their monsters with their field spell, Ice Jades to note, and Neon Cradle. In terms of members, there's Ice Jade Cosmoclore that can spell some itself with as a field spell, and if that specific Ice Jade field spell is active, then your opponent's monsters can only activate effects that turn their summoned. Additionally, if any other Ice Jade monster battles while Cosmoclore is on the field, then that monster loses 1000 attack. Next is Ice Jade Tenola that can special summon a water monster from the graveyard by discarding itself and another card from your hand, and can banish itself to special summon a card from your hand. And then there's Ice Jade Gyrmir, Igarin, which is a level 10 synchro monster that can quick effect prevent your monsters from being destroyed or banished by card effects. Then if a card is banished by your opponent's card while Igarine is in your graveyard, you can special summon itself. So after the trio of the Golden Swords and the Iris Sword Soul save Ecclesia, Albaz and the Spriggans, they have a wonderful reunion. Of course, this happens after Albaz calms down from his rampage. Floorless explains to Ecclesia what happened to the nation after she was exiled, that Maximus has been quite the evil mastermind. Floorless advises that Ecclesia heads to Mount Sword Soul to get her Stigmatica sealed before she takes on Maximus, and Ecclesia takes the advice. But before Ecclesia sets off, a couple of things happen. First, Albaz insists on joining her as they become quite the inseparable duo. Kit gives Ecclesia some new clothes and a hammer created from the skeleton of the serpent she found during the treasure hunt. Right before they head out, Albaz gains a new form for the travels, Albion, and then the two set off. And now the duo travels to Mount Sword Soul. Some other events happen back with Maximus, or as he's known now, the Dramaturge of Despia. The once city of Pyrrhus, Dogmatica, has gone under new management, with a giant theater in place of the nation's main palace. Attempting to rescue whatever survivors there are left, the Tribrigate attempt to fight against the Despians. After getting to the front lines, Shirag notices a few figures lurking around and watching them. The boy shares quite the eerie resemblance to Albaz, but is a lot more theatrical. He uniquely wields holes as if they were extensions of his body. This is especially showcased in Branded in Red, all along the top of the artwork and surrounding Aluber. But Aluber doesn't need to deal with Shirag, he has other priorities. He suddenly transforms himself into a dragon and flies off, which Shirag can only assume he's on his way to Albaz. On the other hand of the allies, there's Kit, who's having trouble sitting idly by while the others fight. So Kit dismembles Bear Brum to create a new suit of armor, and then she goes on her own adventure to the land of Iron Steel to get some new technology to help her friends. And if you remember, that's the volcano where the Therions and Sprites live. As Kit and the Spriggans arrive, they were amazed at the technology in the Disco Coliseum. The group heads towards the leader, the Endless Engine Argyro system, to ask for help. However, the Argyro system is stubborn and only agrees to help unless they can defeat their strongest warriors, the Therions. And who other than their captain himself to first take on the foes stand at the front of them, and the Therions are no joke. The fight between Sargas and Therion King Regulus proves quite the challenge. At one point during the fight, Sargas gets knocked to his knees and can't go on. Regulus decides to end the fight there, after his opponent is defeated despite the Argyro system wanting a much more gruesome outcome for the captain. Outraged, the Argyro system sparks with rage and unleashes the sprites. The sprites, sharing the aggression of the Argyro system, decide to take on both the Spriggans and Therion. The fight ends with a combination attack from Sargas and Regulus knocking out the gigantic sprite. The resultant explosion can be seen by all who are fighting the arena. So things calm down and Kit explains the situation and so their efforts align to stop the Despians. One of the sprites fuses with Regulus, becoming Therion a regular, and they head to what was once known as Dogmatica to help their friends. Our story ended with Kit enlisting the aid of the sprites and Therions through combat, while Ecclesia and Albaz are traveling the Mount Sword Soul to help seal Ecclesia's stigmata. And while it seems like the two are starting to have the solution to the Despian problem, the Despians have sinister plans of their own. The Sword Soul Clan has a clear hierarchy, with the Supreme Sovereign as the head honcho. And almost all the Sword Soul Clan members are fine with this hierarchy, except one, the Sword Soul Strategist Long Young, who desires more power and complete domination over the clan. Now, the Sword Souls each have a distinct sword that are projections of their heart and soul, which is why there is such emphasis on their swords. Uniquely, Long Young had two blades as his malice would be visible to all if he had it out. 
So Long Yong had his other blade of mouths and ill intentions that he hid away from the others so he wouldn't be caught. And before Ecclesia and Albaz arrive, Ad Libitum of Despia approaches Long Yong with an offer for the power he so desires. The power to rule the Sword Soul Clan. And so a deal is made between the two in secret. Just as the deal is made, Long Yong had been summoned back as there are new visitors entering the Sacred Sword Soul Summit, which of course are Ecclesia and Albaz. Now, sitting in front of an audience with the Sovereign himself, Cheng Ying, they were judged before Sword Soul Auspice Chung Jun to see if their hearts were pure. After finding out they were both innocent and good-hearted, they are guided to the Ice Jade Sinotanian Cradle to meet Ice Jade Cosmokar. After talking with both Cheng Ying and Cosmokar, they agree to help as much as they can. And so the three move into the Endian Cradle to suppress both Albaz and Ecclesia Stigmatas. While the group are in the Cradle, Mount Sword Soul had some unwanted visitors. After alerting the whereabouts of the Sacred Mountain, the Despians will launch an attack. Long Yong enters the Ice Jade Cradle with both his blades, the one filled with his determination and the other filled with hatred and spite. And now, with the power of the Despians, he transforms into his true form. Sword Soul Sinister Sovereign, Kuizing Long Yong. With his new form, he launches an attack towards Cosmokar, but is interrupted by Cheng Ying and the two duel. Until Ice Jade's Cosmokar aids Long Yong and creates King Fisher to help. As the battle rages between the two, a new foe enters the battle. A Luber joins the arena and he shows everybody why he's a threat. He restrains Albaz using his power over the holes and steals some of his powers and with it, a Luber transforms into Lubelia. Now with Albaz's power, a Luber attacks Cosmokar and Cheng Ying and deals a massive blow to both of them. As a last resort, they both channel the last of their energies and souls into Albaz, transforming him into the iconic Mirror Jade the Ice Blade Dragon. To take a small break to talk about the cards in the game itself, Let's talk about Mirror Jade, who is a level 8 Dragon Fusion monster with 3000 attack that requires Fallen of Albaz and one Extract monster as its materials. Mirror Jade has the effect that as a quick effect, you can banish one monster on the field by sending a Fusion monster from your stack to the graveyard that requires Fallen of Albaz as material. The other effect, and why Mirror Jade sees a ton of play, is that if this Fusion Summon card leaves the field by an opponent's card, you can destroy all monsters your opponent controls during the end phase. Branded decks ran at least one copy of it as it's one of the best cards to end your board on as the floating effect of its removal on top of its really good quick effect are very serious threats. But now, back to the story. So now with the power of both the Sword Souls and Ice Jades, Albaz is as strong as ever to take on Aluber and Quingzine. Unfortunately, Cosmogor's power has been spent and her life force starts to fade away as she has one less heartful conversation with Agarine, who was like a daughter to her. And in her sorrow and anger, Agarine creates Ice Jade Agarachasis to help fight to defeat the traitorous Quingzine. And the creation helps as both Agarachasis and Albaz down Queensing Long Yong and crash a portion of the cradle into Long Yong and pinning him out of commission. Albaz now sets his sights on Aluber, and as they fight, Aluber starts to create a barrier around them. And as the barrier forms, Ad Libitum of Despia shows up in a portal to invite the others to watch their friends fall. And so they enter to help their friends. Meanwhile, the intense fight between Aluber and Albaz continues. But the barrier in which they are fighting isn't for the protection of the Indian Cradle, it's a trap. The barrier is meant to fuse the two together. And so he begins to fuse both him and Albaz together to create Alba Letitus, the Abyss Dragon, and all hope is lost for Albaz. While the chaos ensues at Mount Sorsal, Flirtilus, Aiden, and Theo head to the Dogmatica capital to stop Maximus, but it seems they've fallen right into their hands, and are surrounded on all sides. So there's no other option. The three engage, now fighting under the Righteous Banner. The group is separated as Flirtilus chases down Maximus, but Flirtilus plays right into Maximus's hands as she easily gets overpowered. And Maximus feeds her soul to the Preskenian. And the timing couldn't be worse, as Flirtilus's soul leaves her body, Ecclesia arrives to witness the end of her sister's life. Too late to save one of her closest friends. But now Maximus's ritual is complete and he starts to channel the power of all the souls he's taken. Now with Aluber and Albaz fusing into one ultimate dragon, within there has been a fight of who stays in control of the dragon. The fight is pretty hopeless as Aluber has full control over his powers. But Albaz hasn't given up, and he strikes the core of Alba Lenitus and breaks free of Aluber's grasp and is expelled out of the dragon. And he even still holds a fragment of Mirror Jade, his very own Ice Jade. After the separation, Albaz retreats while Aluber has some other issues to deal with. As Albaz shattering the core of Alba Lenitus, it released some other draconic beings that were inside Albaz that Aluber had stolen when they were merged, the Bestial Monsters. The Bestial Monsters are an archetype of level 6 and higher dark and light dragon monsters that can special summon themselves from the hand by banishing a light or dark monster from either graveyard. They each have the unique effects that range from searching for a dragon monster to add to your hand to sending a special summon monster opponent controls to the graveyard. The most iconic of the bestial cards is Magma Hut, which has the secondary searching ability. Its popularity is widespread as it can search any dragon type monster when it's special summon, so it synergizes with a wide variety of decks and acts as another version of DD Crow, which works well against meta threats like tier limits. And you might be asking the relation between the branded cards and the bestial ones, so let me explain. 
The bestial monsters all have discrete but significant links to all of Albaz's forms. Druuswarm shares the same body shape as Albion. Magma Hut shares a similar build as Masquerade in terms of both color palette and horns. Serenir has the same strong muscular build as Brie Grant. Last but not least, there's Lubelion, who doesn't quite have an Albaz counterpart, but is just the strongest form of a Luber. In her state of sheer despair after losing her sister, Ecclesia gives in. In her grief, Ecclesia dons a new red dress, becoming blazing Cartesia the Virtuous. And now, the stage is finally set and the characters have their new roles in the grand finale of the playwright of the Albaz. Although the odds are stacked against them, Albaz isn't alone. With the friends he's made at the start of his journey, the Tri-Brigade, he doesn't have to face the Despians by himself. And as Albaz and the Tri-Brigades wait for the Despians to make their move, they hear fireworks in the distance. Making quite the scene on their arrival is none other than Kit atop the Exablower, and she wasn't alone either. She was accompanied, of course, by the Spriggans, but with a much upgraded champion of the Therion Arena. Upon their arrival, Kit runs to her dear friend Shirai and gives him a much-needed firepower upgrade with the Bucephalus II armor. But this means nothing to Aluber. He only sees the ones standing in front of them as ants that need to be crushed. And so Aluber, using the powers of holes, taking the corpses of both the defeated Supreme Sovereign Serpent of Golgonda and the traitorous Queezing, and combines them to show just how powerless Albaz and his puty friends truly are. Emerging from a hole that Aluber created was the Abyss Dragon Sword Soul only fueled by vengeance towards the ones who took everything from him, Albaz. And so the Sword Soul Dragon locked eyes and attacked. Aluber transforms into Lubion once more, and also emerging from the once nation capital that was known as Dogmatica was a girl, pale as snow in a red dress. And she wasn't alone. She was accompanied by a dragon made of brass and the wings of stained glass. With Ecclesia being nowhere to be seen, Albaz's anger and worry grew. With these feelings and the help of Mercurior, he channels his draconic powers to transform using Sprint as an almost template for his transformation, but much stronger as this time he has the support of Kit and her machines. Albaz becomes a mechanized dragon, Rindbrum the striking dragon, and so the two dragons clash. Their battle is fierce, but is swiftly interrupted by a wall of ice separating the two. The same type of ice found at Mount Swordsoul, the same ice as the Ice Jades. Ice Jade Grimir Argernin arrives to the battle, but now with the combined powers of all the other Ice Jades. Accompanying the Queen of the Ice Jades was her very own creation, Ice Jade Creation Argeocasis. With Long Yong's betrayal of the Sword Soul clan, he specifically stabbed Sword Soul Amoye in the back and left her to die. And as a Luber took the Great Sea Serpent and Long Yong and melded them together, Agarin did the same with Moye and Agriocasis, which you can see with the Head of the Beast. Furious to see that he couldn't finish his original goal, the Sword Soul Abyss Dragon changed his focus to his unfinished business. And so Albaz, Shirag, Sargas, and Kit had to find Ecclesia while the two sworn to protect each other fight. But standing in the way is Bistil Albalos, a combination of Despian Proskenion and Lubelion, who sees them coming from a mile away and prepares to blast them in one foul swoop. Sargas raised his arms and unleashed a barrage of missiles and lightning. This devastating attack shatters Albalos and destroys the symbol of the Dogmatica Nation. As Aluber falls, he heads right into the main hall of the theater of the Branded. Albaz tries to chase Aluber as he falls, firing Rimbrum's many weapons, trying to hit him as he descends. But his blasts miss their mark. And once he gets a clear shot, the blast is interrupted. Taking the blows directed at Aluber was Grand Gugnol the Dust Dragon and its rider, Blazing Cartesia the Virtuous. And only now, with Cartesia being so close, does he recognize what truly is going on. Albaz just struck down his best and only friend, who's been corrupted by grief and heartache. Leaping out of Ringbrum, Albaz chases after the following Cartesia, trying to wake her up and bring her back. As the two fall towards Aluber, Albaz's hope is fading. Was there anything that could save Ecclesia from her grief? Not only has Albaz lost his closest friend, but the ritual has been completed. But that's not all. There was one hope left. In Albaz's hand, there was the last fragment of Mirjade, carrying the hopes, dreams, and souls of Albaz, Chang Ying and Klaus Bokor. Using the power residing inside the dagger, he placed it in his dear friend's hands as they fell. Albaz channeled all the hopes and dreams of everyone they've met along their journey and prayed to whatever gods there were that a miracle would happen, and that prayer was answered. Ecclesia woke up. In the past, hearing Ecclesia call out to Albaz had reclaimed him, but hearing Ecclesia say with such joy and hope awoke something in Albaz. Empowered by what could only be called as love and hope, Albaz transformed one more. Soaring to new heights and ready to fight off the Dogmatica and Despian threats, Albion, the incandescent dragon, enters the fray. But as Albion soars, Gragugnol falls. As the massive dragon laid on the ground, pierced by two shots from Ringbrum and its war turned on him, Gragugnol was ready to take its last breath. However, in front of the beast stood Guiding Krim, the Virtuous, or better known as the corrupted white relic of Dogmatica. In a cruel twist of fate, both Fleurless's body and Cartesia's blades were left unattended. 
What was giving life to the dragon was in Cartesia's blade, the sealed stigmata of the most powerful of the Dogmatica saints. Quim would not allow Grand Guggenol's job to be over just yet, and so she broke the seal on Ecclesia's stigmata and drew both Flirtilis and Grand Guggenol in, transforming them into Despian Lulu while Lilith. While the fighting rages on, Maximus has all the time in the world to complete his ritual. In the main hall of the Despian Theater, Maximus' masterpiece is almost complete. It just needs its final piece, Maximus himself, and so his final plan comes to fruition. Something emerges from the Despian Theater, a massive fiend composed of dark, corrupted magic, surrounded by halos of holes emerge from the theater. The twisted, warped, and penultimate Brandon ritual that Maximus set out to cast was complete. He achieved his final form. The leader of the Dogmatica, the evil god of the nation, Dogmatica Albaloa, has risen. But the power of the brand is not so easily controlled. As Albaloa rose and started to make its way to the battlefield, Maximus was struggling to keep his newly obtained power in check. Fighting in and out of consciousness, Albaloa began to transform little by little, spewing more tentacles out from different orifices. Screaming in pain, the whole battlefield froze in terror, wondering if this was Maximus or was this something else. Albazoa let out one last shriek before what seemed like Maximus' struggle stopped. The transformation took too much of a toll on Maximus, and he had lost himself to the overwhelming power of the brand. Bestial Dispater rose in Albazoa's place. Sensing the distinct lack of sanity coming from Dispater, Aluber noticed that Maximus had left his throne open for the taking, his servants and belongings up for grabs. And so Aluber took a tactical retreat, claiming the majority of Maximus' belongings, servants, and more. Heading back into a hole with his newfound treasures, this is the last we hear of Aluber, as he sits back and watches the finale of his grand play unfold. As the epitome of Albaz's strength took on Lulu and Lilith, the two traded blows back and forth. They were dead even in strength. But as they fought, Ecclesia's memories of her sister flooded back into her mind, as she thought that if Albaz's hope could save her from the influence of the Despians, then she could do the same for Flirtless, who had to still be inside Lulu and Lilith. Albion stabbed Lilith in the chest with its horn filled with the power of the Ice Jades and the Sword Souls, and Ecclesia reached through and tried to grasp at what remained of her sister. And another miracle happened that day. Ecclesia found her sister, trapped in the depths, surrounded by the souls of all the other saints that lost their lives in the ritual. Ecclesia reached out, and her love of her sister pulled Flirtless back in command of the shell that is Lulu and Lilith. With a cry of happiness that Flirtless has returned once more to the living world, she raises her blade to the sky and calls down her thunder, striking Despater. Seeing this powerful strike, Shirai, who had been fending off the Despian armor with the rest of the Tri Brigade, understands this is the climax of the fight. Thus, he overclocked his Bucephalus II armor and fired at Despater. And last but not least, Albion channeled all of the power he had left in one final golden blast towards the Fiend. And they did it. The alliance against the Despians. The blast struck down the beast and eviscerated it out of existence. After the dust settled, the fight was truly over. A Luber was nowhere to be found, and the Despians defeated. There were no more threats left on the battlefield, and all rejoiced. Now was the time for celebration and to rebuild. But this isn't the end of the story of the boy from the Hole in the Saint. This is only just the beginning of their adventure. There are so many questions left unanswered, like what happened to Aluber? What are the holes really? But that's for a later time. Ecclesia and Albaz need some time to relax and go on a much less world-ending adventure together, so they take off into the boundless open land for new adventures and tales to share with all their friends. Yu-Gi-Oh! has been around for over a decade and has released a ton of cards throughout the years. Some of these cards are great, some not so much, and some are right in between. So let's go on an adventure to the unknown side of Yu-Gi-Oh! and find some of the more unique cards in its history. Today's episode, we're going to be going over gods and divine beasts. And starting off today's episode is the Dark Lord Monsters. Although the greater archetype story has been covered before in another episode of the series, it's worth noting the inspirations for each of the members, as almost all of the Dark Lord Monsters are based off of Judeo-Christian theology. All of the Dark Lord monsters are dark fairy type monsters which coincide with the themes of the Fallen Angels. And although several of the members in the archetype have made appearances in the shows with duelists like Serenity Wheeler, Rebecca Hawkins, and Fonda Fontaine, the full archetype had one true owner, Midori Hibiki, who was only seen in the Yugo GX manga. The archetype focuses on first sending the Dark Lord monsters to the graveyard, and then special summoning the ones more from the grave, which also works well with the themes of the deck. But now onto the members of the archetype, starting with Dark Lord Amdusk, which is a level 6 monster with 1800 attack and 2800 defense. Amdusk can discard itself and a Dark Lord to add back a Dark Lord monster to your hand, as well as pay 1000 life points to use a Dark Lord spell or trap from your graveyard, then shuffle it back into the deck. Amdusk is based off of Amdusius, which is a commander of the legions of the demons who is typically depicted as a human with claws, the head of a unicorn, and a trumpet to symbolize his command over the legions. Next is Dark Lord Asmodeus, a more well-known member of the archetype as Asmodeus was one of the original Dark Lord monsters. 
Asmodeus has to be normal summoned, as well as once per turn you can send a fairy type monster from your deck to the graveyard. Asmodeus' goal is to be destroyed, as once he is, he can summon two tokens. One can't be destroyed by battle, and the other can't be destroyed by card effects. His inspiration shares the same name as the monster card, and even a similar effect. Asmodeus is the king of both daemons and demons, which is translated through the two tokens that he summons. Dark Lord Desire is one of the higher level Dark Lord monsters, sitting at level 10. This 3000 attack monster can also be tribute summoned by using one fairy monster, which is rather unique as a summoning condition for older Yu-Gi-Oh. Additionally, once per turn, you can allow Desire to lose 1000 attack to send one target monster opponent controls to the graveyard. Desire's is based off Mammon or Greed. Dark Lord Mari is one of the more iconic cards of the archetype, as it was known as Mari the Fallen One before it was eroded so it would fit into the archetype. Due to this, it's actually the only non-fairy monster in the archetype. For some reason, Konami wanted to keep the original name of Mari. Mari is a reference to the Virgin Mary. Although the naming isn't the same, the other translations for the card match up with the biblical name of Maria. Surprisingly, Lucifer the Fallen Angel has two references within the Dark Lord archetype. There's the more obvious Dark Lord Morningstar, which is the boss monster of the archetype, as well as Dark Lord Nurse Rafikiel. Although Dark Lord Morningstar is the more direct reference, Rafikiel was the original. She came out a whole year before the very first member of the archetype, Dark Lord Zerato, would be released. To further this, Rafikiel is a romanization of the name Lucifer written backwards. Although Rafikiel's effect isn't entirely unique, as it shares the same effect as Bad Reaction to Samochi, it's still one of the few cards that changes a critical aspect of the game. That being, causing any life point gain to do damage instead. This unique effect has been utilized in gimmicky OTK decks that utilize mass life point gain cards like Gift Card. Dark Lord Nastin is arguably the most intimidating looking of the Dark Lord monsters. Although his beast-like appearance isn't indicative of what biblical figure he's meant to represent, his wings are the giveaway. See, Nastin is based off of Mastema, which was the Angel of Disaster, the father of evil who became corrupted and convinced God to condemn all demons. See, rather than the card itself, how this is referenced is in the card art of the cards Forbidden Droplet, when Nastin is converted into a demon, or in the case of Dark Lord, Dark Lord Contract, where Nastin goes to the gates of heaven to meet with God and the sanctified Dark Lord, where Nastin meets with God to try to convince him to condemn the demons. The last notable Dark Lord monster is Dark Lord Superbia, which is a level 9 monster with 2900 attack and 2400 defense. It has the simple effect that when it's special summoned from the graveyard, you can special summon another fairy monster from the graveyard. Although not outright shouting as a reference, Superbia's inspiration is the deadly sin of pride, as Superbia in Latin means pride. Although there are a couple more Dark Lord monsters in the archetype, they mainly refer to Mayan theology, which we'll save for another episode. But on the topic of deities and gods, let's talk about the ones in Yu-Gi-Oh! So everyone knows the god cards like Sliver the Sky Dragon, Obelisk the Tormentor, and the Winged Dragon of Ra. They are part of the pretty exclusive attribute called Divine, and an equally exclusive type called Divine Beast. Now, although officially they are the only ones, except for one case, there are actually a couple of other monsters that are considered Divine Beast or Divine Monsters that aren't exactly Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG or OCG specific. But let's talk about the fourth card in the god trio, Halakti the Creator of Light. This level 12 divine monster has question mark stats and is the only card in its type, which is the creator god type monster. So arguably more powerful than the god cards themselves. Its effect is a summoning condition and is essentially a game winner card. It can only be special summoning by tributing all three god cards and your opponent can't negate the summon. Once summoned, you simply win the duel. Now in terms of specifically divine beast monsters, there are a couple more exceptions according to the Yu-Gi-Oh! R comic as well as the 5D anime. There's the Sacred Beast, also known as the Three Phantasms, Ura, Lord of Searing Flames, Hamon, Lord of Striking Thunder, and Raviel, Lord of Phantasms, who, all according to the Yu-Gi-Oh! R comic, are Divine Beast-type monsters. But in the TCG and OCG, they are Thunder, Pyro, and Fiend. Even their fused form, Armor Tile the Chaos Phantasm, is just a Fiend-type monster. There are also the Wicked Gods that share the same source for the credibility of being Divine Beasts. The Wicked Avatar, the Wicked Dreadroot, and the Wicked Eraser are all Divine Beast types according to the manga, as they are dark counterparts to the original god cards, probably weaker as they're only level 10 rather than the gods level 12. Following Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, there's also Divine Beast monsters from the 5D's era. The Azure God Synchro monsters are also considered Divine Beasts as well as a Divine type according to the 5D's anime. Loki, Lord of the Azure, was changed to a Dark Spellcaster. Thord, Lord of the Azure, was changed to an Earth Beast Warrior, and Odin, Father of the Azure, was changed to Light Fairy. It's pretty unfortunate that this group is so exclusive. As a whole, the god cards are pretty unique, so it's both good and bad that these cards are in such a niche group. However, there are cards that can easily overpower the so-called strongest cards in the game in one way or another, just like the next cards on our list. Get all the jokes out now everyone, as next up we have number 69, Heldred Crest. This rank 4 Xyz monster needs any 3 level 4 monsters for its summit. This light psychic monster has 2600 attack and comes with a pretty unique effect. 
Once summoned, Hell's Crest negates the effects of all other Xyz monsters in the field. Then you can target another Xyz monster in the field, and Hell's Crest will copy its name and original effect until the end phase. On top of that, it doesn't even need to detach materials, so you're free to use the copied effect of another Xyz monster. However, despite the unique effect of Heraldry Crest, that's not entirely why it's on today's episode of the Unknown Sign. See, in the Zexal anime, Heraldry Crest had a significantly more powered up effect. In the anime, Vetrix wielded the Heraldry Crest. Long story short, Vetrix was the secondary big bad of the World Duel Carnival arc, and him, alongside his three sons, Trey, Quattro, and Quinto, targeted Yuma to capture Utopia. And yes, you heard me right, Vetrix has three sons. Despite looking like and being the size of a child, he was tricked into opening a door to another dimension which matured Vetrix into his miniature-sized man. In the anime, Heldry Crest had a bit stronger of an effect. Rather than being just an anti xyz card, it's more of an anti-card in general. In the anime, Crest's effect was that the effects of all other face-up monsters are negated, while at the same time, Heraldry Crest would gain those effects. Yes, effects plural. So that means Heraldry Crest could have multiple effects at the same time. On top of that, not only does Heraldry Crest have card effect destruction immunity, in the anime, number cards, so cards that have number before them, like number 69 Heraldry Crest, can only be destroyed by other number monsters. So Heraldry Crest had some pretty amazing survivability. The last effect of Heraldry Crest, and what it can use its materials for, is that when your opponent's monster declares an attack, you can detach a material to target and destroy one card your opponent controls. So suffice to say, the enemy Heraldry Crest is arguably one of the stronger floodgates in the game. But that's not where it ends. Heraldry Crest, like other Xyz monsters, can evolve into its C form. Number C69 Heraldry Crest of Horror, sitting as a rank 5 with the same attribute and type as its previous form, C69 is quite a bit stronger, with a staggering 4000 attack and 1600 defense. However, with such an impressive stat line, C69 requires a lot of materials, specifically 4 level 5 monsters. The payoff is its multiple effects. The first is that when an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can destroy all cards your opponent controls. Then, if its previous form, number 69 Heraldry Crest, is attached as a material, it gains its detaching material effect. Which is that, once per turn, you can detach a material to target one face-up Xyz monster your opponent controls, then C69 gains attack equal to that face-up monster's original attack, and C69 copies that monster's name and effects until the end phase. This version of Heraldry Crest has a couple of records under its name. It's the highest attack of any psychic monster, as well as the highest attack of any rank 5. The closest competitors are Digvorzak, King of Heavy Industry with 3200 attack for rank 5s, and Hyper Psychic Blaster slash Assault Mode at 3500 attack for Psychic. The impressive attack point value C69 is the combination of the previous attack and defense of the original 69 with 2600 attack and 1400 defense. On top of that, C69 was a pioneer of a couple of things. It was the first number C Psychic Monster, as well as the first card to be summoned by Chaos Field. This was an anime-exclusive field spell that had one special effect. Once per turn, you can detach material from a C number card you control to special summon a random number card from your opponent's extra deck, with the cost of not being able to attack, having its effects negated, and being destroyed during the end phase, unless you activated the secondary effect of Chaos Field. This second effect was that you would target an Xyz monster that was special summoned from your opponent's extra deck by the first effect, then Xyz summon from your extra deck one C Xyz monster that's one rank higher than the monster by using it as a material. Unlike the original Heraldry Crest, C69's anime counterpart isn't as unfair to play against. The anime version has a slightly stronger effect, but not too different. It has the standard battle immunity for number monsters, as well as its copying effect lasts until your next standby phase, rather than just the end phase. And for good measure, it has the original Heraldry Crest effect that when an opponent's monster declares an attack, you can destroy all cards your opponent controls. Ending today's episode is a level 6 ritual monster, Revenge Red Slayer. Requiring any Vendred ritual spell to summon, Slayer is the quote-unquote main character of the Vendred archetype. Its effect allows it to, during damage calculation, banish a zombie monster from your graveyard to boost its attack by 300 points, bringing it to 2700, which isn't too bad for a level 6 monster. On top of that, if the ritual summoned Slayer is sent to the graveyard, you can search for any ritual spell from your deck and foolish a Vendred monster, meaning you send it from your deck to the graveyard. Although this seems underwhelming, Revenge Red Slayer works extremely well than its archetype. See, the Vendred archetype, or at least the non-ritual monsters, have the two typical effects. The first typically revolves around special summoning the monster from the graveyard, and the other is that if the monster is used for a ritual summon of a Vendred ritual monster, it gains an additional effect. So, for example, Vendred Core is a level 1 dark zombie monster with 0 attack and 500 defense. Its effects are that 1. If it's in the graveyard, you can banish another zombie monster to special summon Vendred Core from your graveyard, but banish it when it leaves the field. 
The other effect is that if core is used in a ritual summon of a Vendred monster, it gives the ritual monster the effects of being unable to be targeted by your opponent's card effects. Despite the unique mechanic of the Vendred monsters, why they are on today's episode of the Unknown Side is due to their story and their inspirations. The Vendred monsters are a combination of a couple of different horror series like Resident Evil and The Thing, as well as their short lore related story. And fun fact, the archetype was one of the two TCG exclusive archetypes introduced to the game, with the other being the FA monsters. There are six non-ritual Vendred monsters that are all somewhat different in their effects but accomplish the same goals, but they are also all inspiration from other series. There's the aforementioned Vendred Core, which is based off of Resident Evil's Ouroboros virus, and the Necroplasm virus. There's Vendred Stridges, which is based off of the Crows from Resident Evil, and it can special summon itself by revealing a Vendred card, as well as it provides after battle calculation of your ritual monster to draw and discard a card. There's Hound Horde, which is based off of the Thing's Kennel Thing, which are essentially zombie dogs. Hound Horde can special summon itself by discarding a Vendred card, and it allows your ritual monster to quick effect banish a spell and trap that your opponent controls. Then there's Vendred Revenants, which are your typical zombies which can special summon itself when destroyed by an opponent's card, and lets your ritual monster banish a special summon monster of your opponent's. Last is the Scar the Vendred, which is somewhat unique. Scar the Vendred doubles down on the graveyard support rather than being a ritual material. See, Scar's effect, once it's sent to the graveyard, you can search a Vendred spell or trap and add it to your hand. Then, if a monster is tributed, you can banish another zombie monster to special summon Scar. So essentially, you get a search and a 2300 attack beat stick, which isn't too bad. So, let's briefly touch on the lore. In the City of Heroes, a zombie apocalypse broke out. Likely an experiment gone wrong, the Vendred core was exposed to the population and things took a turn for the worse. However, rather than saving the city, it was decided the area would be quarantined. It was decided that there would be no evacuation, that nobody within the quarantine area could be saved, and so the few survivors were locked in with no chance of escape. A family man was locked inside. He had already lost his wife, his everything in the initial wave of zombies. Sheer rage came over him when he was infected, and rather than becoming another mindless zombie, he became the Revenge Red Slayer. Slayer spends his nights taking vengeance on those who took everything from him, eradicating the zombies that plagued his home. As his fight continues, he approaches a giant mass of flesh. Could this be the source of the zombies? If I kill this thing, would I save my city? Slayer thought to himself. Either way, he was taking this giant flesh sheep down. Vendred Slayer charged the amalgamation of zombie fight creatures. Cutting deep into its body with various slashes, it only seemed to anger the monster. Vendred Chimera was deeply angered, but it wasn't attacking back. Vendred Chimera started shifting around, curling into a defensive position, and then burrowed away. Slayer followed suit, but he was surprised at how fast the Chimera dug. Reaching over a mountain of debris, Slayer arrived and it was a trap. Standing in front of him was what could only be described as the leader of the zombies, the source, Vendred Battlelord. But Slayer wasn't intimidated one bit. In fact, he was more cheerful at the opportunity to go all out and enacted vengeance on the horde of zombies. Vendred Slayer charged in, attacking and tearing through the hordes of zombies. It didn't matter their numbers, it didn't matter their strength, all that mattered was that Slayer would live up to his name and slay. He leapt at Battlelord with no hesitation, ripped out his heart in mere moments. It all happened so fast, not even the zombie that survived understood what happened. As the source of the pandemic fell to the ground and started to decay, Vendred Slayer started to assimilate the infected heart of Battlelord, gaining new powers, becoming Revendred Executor. With the day saved, Slayer, or the now Executor, can be at peace and rest with his wife in the afterlife. Although the story of Vendred monsters is pretty short, it's nice in comparison to other larger archetypes like Albaz or Visa Starfrost. Some nice, smaller, self-contained stories to balance out the longer ones. In this episode, we're going to be talking about one of the newer archetypes, but one of the strongest to date, and that is the Visa Starfrost and its three counterparts that comprise some of the most well-known archetypes, the Scareclaws, Telements, Kashtiras, and the Monadiums. And to keep this episode not running for too long, this episode will establish context and breakdowns of the archetypes for the next video, where we break down the actual story. But even before we talk about the archetypes, let's talk about the main character of our story, Visa Starfrost. Starfrost is a level 6 light tuner with 2100 attack and 1500 defense, with a pretty simple effect. While Visus is in your hand, you can destroy one monster you control with a different type and attribute than itself, so any non-light and non-warrior monster, to special summon Visus from your hand. There's also a secondary effect that if Visus Starfrost destroys an opponent's monster by battle, then Visus gains attack equal to half the original target defense of the monster. In terms of design, just keep a note of Visus' features like his otherworldly arm, his stat line, as well as the highlights in his hair as it'll come up later in our identifying features. So, let's start with the Scare Claws. This archetype of Earth Beast Monsters focuses on Link Summoning forcing monsters into defense position. The archetype is divided into two groups, the Main Deck Monsters, which are more support-focused, and the Link Monsters. So, let's start with the main boss monster, Scare Claw Tryheart. This is a Link 3 Dark Beast War monster with a standard 3000 attack, and has all of its arrows pointing downwards. 
Tryheart has three effects. The first one is pretty minor, which is that it must be Link Summon. The other effect is where Tryheart shows its strength. Then, all face-up monsters in the field are changed to defense position, and Tryheart is unaffected by the activated effects of defense position monsters. So essentially, it's a floodgate of sorts, preventing all non-Link monsters from attacking or targeting Tryhard for effects. Last is that if Tryhard is in the extra monster zone, once per turn, you can target a level 3 Scareclaw monster that's in your graveyard and special summon it. On top of that, when you do, you can add any Scareclaw monster from your deck to your hand. Now, although the Monster Reborn and the Search Effect are strong, the true reason why Tryhard is so scary is the Floodgate, and that very few cards can deal with such an effect, especially as the other cards the archetype punish your opponent for having monsters in defense position. Speaking of, let's get into them. All of the main deck members of the Scare Claws are Earth Beast monsters that are level 3 and have 0 attack points. They all have the same effects as special summon themselves to the main monster zone adjacent to another Scare Claw monster in defense mode. Then, each of the main deck monsters have effects that affect monsters in defense position, like Scareclaw Arco, who lets your Scareclaw monsters in the extra monster zone gain 300 attack for every defense position monster that you control. So, with the full field, Tryhard gains 1500 attack points, bringing him to 4500 attack, which is nothing to scoff at. However, on most occasions, you'll just have the three main deck Scareclaw monsters, meaning Tryhard will be at 3900 attack points. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Scareclaw Belone gives piercing damage to your Scareclaw monsters that's in the extra monster zone. So on top of the attack boost that Arco provides, the good Scareclaw boy dismantles any defense boost of monsters that are in Tryhard's way. The only thing that could complete the trifecta and allow some massive damage to be output is if the Tryhard could attack multiple times. Scareclaw Astra is the last main deck monster and is the OTK enabler for the archetype. As on top of the archetypal effect, he allows your Scareclaw monsters in the extra monster zone to attack a number of times equal to the number of Scareclaw monsters you control with different names. With all three main deck monsters easily able to special themselves from the hand, three attacks with 3900 damage and piercing damage and unaffected by all non-leak monster effects is nothing to scoff at. Unless you run battle traps, which few decks do in the current meta, then you'll have an issue getting rid of Tryhard. It's also worth noting that each of the Scareclaw main deck monsters are based on real fears. Their names alone aren't reason enough, but combined with the artwork and lore, the pieces start falling into place. Scareclaw Arco is based off of Arcophobia, or the fear of heights. This is represented through Arco being the only Scareclaw beast to have wings. Astra is based off of Astrophobia, which is the fear of thunder and lightning, which is seen on Astra with the two thunder orbs that are on its back and tail. Not to mention the various surges of lightning coming from the orbs. Last is Balone, who represents Balonophobia, which is the fear of sharp objects like needles, which is the most common example of the phobia. And we see this, like the other Scareclaw monsters, where needles are mounted on Balone's back. The last main deck monster of the Scareclaws is Scareclaw Reichardt, and is the leader of the Scareclaws. This level 4 Dark Warrior monster has 1500 attack and 2100 defense, and like the other Scareclaw main deck monsters, Reichardt can special summon itself to a monster zone adjacent to another Scareclaw monster that you control. Then, on normal or special summon, you can add any Scareclaw spell or trap card from your deck to your hand. On top of that, if there are 3 or more defense wizard monsters in the field, so either yours or your opponents, you can draw a card too. There are 3 main options for which Scareclaw spell or trap card to add to your hand with this effect. There's Scareclaw Arrival, which is essentially an archetypal monster reborn and can banish itself to protect a Scareclaw Link monster from being destroyed. There's Scareclaw Straddle, which is a quick play that lets you either have your Scareclaw or Visa Starfrost gain attack or defense equal to a monster your opponent's controls, or an Omni Negate for anything that targets either your Visas or Scareclaw monsters. Or last, the continuous trap card, Scareclaw Sclash, which is essentially an Omni Negate while you control a Scareclaw monster and once per turn lets your Scareclaw monsters attack from defense position. All three are great options and are related to the story, which we'll get into in just a bit. Last, but certainly not least in terms of monsters, is the only other monster of the group, Scareclaw Lightheart. This Link 1 monster with its arrows pointed to the left has 500 attack and requires either one Scareclaw monster or a Visa Starfrost monster. This chibi version of Reichardt is the combo starter and one of the best cards for the archetype. If Lightheart is Link Summoned to the extra monster zone, you can add one primitive planet Reichphobia from your deck to your hand. Then, if you control a Visa Starfrost, you can special summon Lightheart from your graveyard. Despite how simple the effect sounds, Lightheart is a one card combo. The last big piece of the Scareclaw archetype is the field spell Primitive Planet Reichphobia. Not only is this where our story starts, but it's a key piece of the Scareclaw archetype. When activated, you can add one Scareclaw monster or Visa Starfrost from your deck to your hand. Then, monsters your opponent controls lose 100 attack and defense for each defense with a monster on the field. And lastly, if three or more defense position monsters are on the field, you can target one card your opponent controls and destroy it. And all of these effects are on a once per turn. Regardless, the archetypal field spell is the true icing on top for the archetype, and puts Scareclaw as a strong but simple archetype. There are also a couple of important spells and traps of the archetype that both highlight the lore and some powerful effects. Starting with the trap card, Scareclaw Alternative, which lets you tribute three Scareclaw monsters to force your opponent to special summon monsters in defense position. On top of that, you can banish Alternative from your graveyard for some nice burn damage to your opponent, dealing 100 damage per defense with a monster on the field. Which pairs well with Tryhard as he forces all monsters except Link monsters into defense position. 
so the only out being Link monsters, your opponent can't even summon them. Scareclaw Defanging is a continuous spell card that prevents your opponent from targeting or destroying Scareclaw or Visa Starfrost with card effects. Also, you can banish any monster destroyed by battle with your Scareclaw Link monsters. And last, you can banish a Scareclaw Link monster from your field or graveyard to destroy one card your opponent controls. In terms of lore, the basics of the Scareclaws are as such. On the primitive planet Rykphobia, also known as the Fourth Broken World, Rykhart rules over his subjects as the true Beastmaster of the Scareclaw Beasts. Defying his aesthetic and overall intimidating demeanor, Reichardt is a pretty good ruler, and is pretty compassionate towards his beasts. The planet that Reichardt rules is based off of social Darwinism, meaning the strongest survives and is the king of the beasts, so to speak. Day in and day out, Reichardt trains his beasts for the inevitable threat that is coming their way, the Cash Tiras. Next up, there are the Tier Laments, our favorite Mildak, fusion-based, aqua-type monsters. The group lives on the primeval planet Pellerino, or the first broken world under the tyrannical rule of Rhinohart who uses his three-pronged whip to not only assert his dominance, but to also brainwash his fellow tier limits to make sure they're subservient. Rhino Heart, as previously mentioned, is the head honcho of the tier limits, and like Rykark, wasn't a beast type with the Scareclaws, but rather a warrior-type monster. Rhino Heart is the same type. Tier Limits Rhino Heart is a level 4 water warrior monster with 1500 attack and 2100 defense. Its effect reads that when it's normal or special summoned, you can send one tier limit monster from your deck to the graveyard. Then, if Rhino Heart is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can special summon it and send a card from your hand to the graveyard. Next up are Tier Limits Havnus, Merrily, and Shiren. These three Dark Aqua monsters are the remaining main deck monsters of the Tier Limits. Each have the archetypal effects that if they're sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can fusion summon using materials from your hand, fill to a graveyard, and place them on the bottom of your deck. In terms of specific effects, each of the main deck monsters' effects on top of their archetypal effect mills cards. Tier Limits Shiren can special summon itself from the hand and mill 3 cards. Tier Limits Merely just mills 3 on summon, and Havnus special summon itself when your opponent activates a monster effect and mills 3 cards from the top of your deck. And lastly, at least in terms of monsters for the Tier Limits, are the extra deck monsters, of which there are 3 total. Starting with Tier Limits Kitkalos, a level 5 dark aqua monster that requires 1 Tier Limit and 1 aqua monster to fusion summon. With a stat line of 2300 attack and 200 defense, you might not expect much. However, its effect is what truly makes Kitkalos such a threat even to the point that it is currently in the Forbidden list in the TCG. Its effect is that on its special summon, you can add a Tier Limit card from your deck to either your hand or send it to the graveyard. Keep in mind that this effect can proc the Tier Limit's fusion cards. Also, once per turn, you can target one monster you control, then special summon a Tier Limit's monster from your hand or graveyard, and then send the targeted monster to the graveyard. And lastly, if Kid Colossus is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can mill the top 5 cards of your deck. So, suffice to say, Kid Colossus is a phenomenal extender of the archetype. But what makes it such a threat is that Kikolos evolves once more into the level 8 Rukalos. With a typical boss monster stat line of 3000 attack and 2500 defense, you'd be surprised to know this isn't the real boss monster of the archetype, but we'll get into that in just a second. Rukalos needs to be fusion summoned by using Tilmit Kikolos and any other Tilmit monster. While in the field, other aqua monsters you control can't be destroyed by battle. Additionally, once per turn, at the cost of sending Tilmit's card from your hand or field to the graveyard, you can negate and destroy one of your opponent's effects that includes a special summoning of a monster. And lastly, if a fusion summon Rukalos is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can special summon it once more. Now, the evolution of Kid Kalos into Rukalos has some lore explaining the evolution. Essentially, prior to Reinhardt's rule, the main deck Tilmit monsters were in their strongest forms. But when Reinhardt came, he stripped them of the power so that he could stay as the ruler of the broken world. But that changes in the story. The last and true boss monster of the Tilaments is Tilaments Kaleidoheart. This level 9 Dark Fiend monster has both 3000 attack and defense, and requires a fusion of Tier Limits Rhino Heart and two Aqua monsters. This represents Kaleida Heart drawing in and using the power of the other Tier Limits monsters to strengthen himself. The boss monster on special summon, or if an Aqua monster is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can shuffle one card your opponent controls into the deck. And its last effect is that if Kaleida Heart is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can send a Tier Limits card from your deck to the graveyard and then special summon it back. Although there are a good couple of spell and trap cards of the archetype, their card artwork depicts a lot of the lore regarding what happens in the primeval planet Pelerino. So without spoilers, let's talk about the spell and trap cards of the tier limits. The primeval planet Pelerino is the field spell of the archetype, or at least one of them. When activated, you can search for a tier limits or visas and add it to your hand. If your tier limits monster is shuffled into the deck outside of the damage step, you can destroy one card in the field. There's Tier Limits Grief, which is a spell card that lets you special summon a Tier Limits or Visa Starfrost from your deck at the cost of sending a monster you control of the same type or attribute of the special summon monster to the graveyard. Tier Limits Heartbeat is a quick play spell that lets you target either a spell or trap on the field and shuffle them into the deck at the cost of sending one card from your hand to the graveyard. This effect increases to two cards if you control a Visa Starfrost, and if Heartbeat is sent to the graveyard, you can add a Tier Limit Trap card from your graveyard to your hand. Tier Limits Perlegia is a field spell that lets you foolish burial another level 4 or lower aqua monster when another Tier Limits monster is sent to a graveyard by a card effect. 
There is a caveat to such a strong effect, however. If you send a non-Atelements monster card this effect, you can't activate the effects of the sent cards. Tier Limit Scream is a continuous spell that lets you mill the top three cards of your deck if a monster is no more special summoned while you control a Tier Limit's monster. And if Tier Limit Scream is sent to the grave by a card effect, you can add a Tier Limit Trap from your deck to your hand. Tier Limit's Meta Noise is a trap card that lets you change a monster your opponent controls to face down defense position if you control a Tier Limit's monster. It also lets you Fool's Burial another Tier Limit's monster from your deck. If the trap card is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can add back a Tier Limit's monster from your graveyard to your hand. Tier Limit's Crime is a counter trap with an Omni Negate that shuffles the card back to the deck. The cost of such is needing to control a Tailwind's monster, as well as sending a monster from your hand to the graveyard. Additionally, if Crime is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can add back a banished Tailwind's monster to your hand. And last but not least is Tailwind Suliak. This continuous trap allows you to target and negate your opponent's monster effect, and also send one monster you control to the graveyard, as long as you control the Tailwind monster. Additionally, it's a search for any Tailwind monster if it's sent to the graveyard by a card effect. The Kashtira are a deck that is focused on banishing your opponent's cards face down and locking them out of zones. The Kashtiras inhabit the pressured planet Wraithsoth. The sixth broken world and is ruled by an iron fist of pure power, Kashtira Riseheart and his lieutenants, the other Kashtira monsters. The Kashtira main deck monsters each have a search effect as well as an effect to banish a card face down when either they battle or a monster effect is activated by your opponent. The field spell, the pressure planted rates off on activation, searches for a Kashtira monster. Then, monsters you control gain 100 attack per different attribute on the field. Last, if the Kashtira Shangara activates its effect outside of the damage step, you can destroy one card on the field. The Kashtiras are the quote unquote bad guys of the Visa story, despite the leader of the Kashtiras being a version of Visa himself. Either way, they are the main antagonists, and Riseheart is aware of the other versions of Visas and intends to capture them before he gets absorbed. The level 4 Fire Warrior monster is a key support for the other Kashtira monsters. While you control another Kashtira monster, you can special summon Riseheart from your hand, although this locks you into Xyz monsters for the rest of the turn. That's exactly what the Kashtiras are built for, as the Kashtiras are the XC variants of Visas. The same way the Scare Claws are the Link versions and the Teal Elements are the Fusion versions. Continue with the Rise Heart's effects, during the main phase, if Rise Heart is summoned this turn, you can banish the top three cards of your opponent's deck face down for the cost of banishing a cash tier from your deck. If this effect goes through, Rise Heart becomes level 7, which conveniently is the level of the Rise Heart's true form. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the other main deck cash tier monsters. There's the Brute of the cash tier, the Water Psychic level 7 monster, cash tier Ogre. With a well off 2800 attack points, cash tier Ogre can special summon itself from your hand if you control no monsters. On once per turn cooldown, Ogre has two effects. First is that you add a cast your trap card from your deck to your hand. Then, if Ogre declares an attack or your opponent activates a monster effect, you can excavate the top five cards of your opponent's deck and banish one of those cards face down. Next up is the scout of the cast the wind level 7 cast tier unicorn. The 2500 attack point psychic monster can special summon itself if you control no monsters and it has a once per turn clause on its effect. Like Ogre, during the main phase, you can add a cast tier spell from your deck to your hand. Then, if unicorn attacks or if your opponent activates a monster effect, you can banish a card face down from your opponent's extra deck. Unlike Ogre, Unicorn is one of the more used Kashtira cards, as the archetypal spell cards are pretty strong and are great extenders for the archetype. The last of Lieutenants is Kashtira Fenrir. This level 7 Psychic Earth Monsters follows the trends of the other Kashtira monsters. It can special summon itself from your hand if you control no monsters, and can add a Kashtira monster from your deck to your hand once per turn. And if Fenrir attacks or a monster effect is activated, you can target a face-up card your opponent controls and banish it face down. Kashtiras only have two extra deck monsters within the archetype, but they are some of the strongest out of all of the Visa Starfrost cards. Kashtira Shingra Ira is a fire psychic XCs with a surprising 0 attack but 3000 defense. Requiring two or more level 7 monsters, Shangri Ra is meant to be a zone locking Death Star. Kashtira monsters can get beamed down from the Death Star, as during each standby phase, you can special summon a Kashtira monster from your deck. The real damage comes in Shangri Ra's second effect, which, each time a card in your opponent's possession is banished face down, you can lock your opponent out of a monster or a spell trap card zone until Shangri Ra leaves the field. On top of that, the psychic monster has some built in protection, as both those previous effects don't require any detached material. If Shangri Ra would be destroyed by Battle or Card Effect, you can detach material from the card instead. Like the Death Star, this is what the other Visa Star Frost variants fear, as the Kashtiras travel to other planets and dominate them using Shangri Ra's immense power. The last of the Kashtira monsters is the powered up form of Riseheart, Kashtira Riseheart. This rank 7 Dark Machine Xyz monster requires 3 level 7 monsters as materials, but most of the time you won't be using 3 level 7 monsters. Rather, a Rise Heart can be XC summoned once per turn by using a cash tier monster you control if the effect of Shangri Ra was activated successfully this turn. So, once the damage has been done with Shangri Ra, then a Rise Heart comes in to finish the job. When he arrives, things get bad for those who stand in his way. He has three additional effects. First is a Macrocosmos type floodgate, meaning any card that is sent to the graveyard is banished instead. 
Second is that once per chain, each time a card is banished, you can add one of the banished cards as material. And what does Arise Heart do with all these accumulated enemies that he's taken over? Well, he releases a devastating attack. By detaching three materials, you can target and banish a card face down. And before we end this section on the Kashtiras, let's go over the remaining cards in the archetype, the spells and traps, starting with Kashtira Preparations. This continuous trap lets you special summon a Kashtira monster from your hand, or that is banished during either player's turn. Then if you control a Kashtira monster while Kashtira Preparations in your spell trap card zone, you can banish a card from your opponent's hand. Kashtira Big Bang is a normal trap that has the effect that if your Kashtira XCs monsters in the field and a player controls two more monsters, they must banish face down monsters so they only control one. Then if Big Bang is banished, you can add any Kashtira XCs monster from one of your XCs monsters to your hand, and then you can special summon it. Kashtira Overlap is a quick play spell that lets you target one monster and banish another monster from anywhere but your deck that has 1500 attack and 2100 defense, which if you've been paying attention is any of the Visa's variants. The targeted monster then gains 1500 attack points which is pretty impressive for an attack point gain card. Then, if Overlap is banished and you control a Kashtira monster, you can negate the effects of one monster your opponent controls. Kashtira Birth is a continuous spell that lets you normal summon level 7 monsters without tributing. And during your main phase, you can special summon a non xyz Kashtira monster that's banished or in your graveyard. On top of that already great effect, if your opponent activates a spell or effect while you control a Kashtira monster, you can banish three cards face down from your opponent's graveyard. Kashtira Extra is another quick play spell that has the effect that if your face-up Kashtira XYZ monster is destroyed by a battle or card effect, you can banish a Visa Star Frost from anywhere except the graveyard, and then cheat out a Vicious Astrolaud from your extra deck. Which is another important lore-related card, but we'll save that for when it shows up in the story. If Axtra is banished, you can target a banished Vicious Star Frost and add it to your hand. And last, and most known of the Kashtira Spell and Trap cards, is Kashtira Theosis. It lets you special summon from your deck a different attribute Kashtira monster than you already control, at the cost of locking you to only XC's monsters for the turn. Then, if the card is banished, you can add back to your hand another Kashtira card that's banished. Kashtira Theosis is a one card combo right into Kashtira Shangri Ra, which lets you go into a Rise Heart once its effect is activated. So, suffice to say, Theosis is one of the strongest cards of the archetype. Welcome back to the unknown side of Yu Gi Oh! Last time we discussed a lot of cards that are centered around Visa Starfrost and its lore. Today, we're going to go over the entire story of the archetype. So, the story of Visa Starfrost starts like how it was introduced in the TCG. Seemingly, out of nowhere, with no other relation to other cards. When Visus Starfrost was released in Dimension Force Premiere as the promo card for the set, Visus was given out at in-person events for the set release. There were no other cards previously that mentioned or were related to Visus, so players were somewhat confused. Especially as this was during the Albaz era, and we were getting tons of support and lore for their story. Regardless, here we are today. Our story starts with Visus floating through the endless void of space. He has no memory of where he is or how he got to where he is. All he knows is that parts, yes, parts, plural, are missing from him, and something separated those pieces from him. Visas has a vague idea of where these parts of him have gone off to, as well as the fact that they've been gone for a while. But now that Visas has awakened once more, he can retrieve them and become whole once again. So, Visas heads to the primitive planet Rykphobia, where we can even see Visas' arrival in the artwork of the field spell. As I mentioned in the last video, each of the primitive planets are also named Broken Worlds which symbolize how each of these broken pieces of Visas leads to their respective planets. And the leader of Reichphobia is the King of Fears, Scareclaw Reichhardt. Upon Visas' arrival, he wasn't greeted too kindly by the residents of the planet. The residents of the planet weren't too pleased either as their leader, Reichhardt, knew what Visas was there for. Reichhardt knew as soon as Visas arrived what he wanted, which was to reassimilate back into Visas. But Reichhardt wouldn't go down without a fight, as Reichhardt had created his own family and land to rule over, and he wasn't ready to give up yet. So, Scareclaw Reichhardt powered up and combined with the other Scareclaw beasts and became Scareclaw Triheart, and the two clashed. Thankfully for Visas, he didn't forget how to fight. After the killing blow was struck, Triheart separated once more into the individual Scareclaw monsters, and Reichhardt gradually accepted his defeat, as Visas had proven he was the strongest on the primitive planet. Reichhardt had built his empire on the survival of the fittest mentality, so when Visas took down their head honcho, Visas became the new pack leader, so to speak. With the new scare clause by Visa signed, Visa Starfrost decided to take his leave to figure out where the other parts of Visa were. So, as Visa was flying through space, he heard a voice by his side guiding him towards the next target, and it was his Reichhardt. But not really. See, once Visa absorbed the pack leader, Triheart wanted to keep helping Visa, so he manifests himself as Scareclaw Lightheart to help Visa when he needed. Not too long after leaving Primitive Planet Reichphobia, Visa figured out where the next piece of himself was the primitive planet Pelerino. Each of the broken worlds and parts of Visas that he aims to recover represent different emotions that Visas has. Scareclaws were the emotions of fear, 
as seen with each of the Scare Club Beasts, as well as the names of the various cards containing either Scare or Phobia in them. Similarly, Pelor Rhino and its inhabitants, the Tear Laments, represent Sorrow. Pelor Rhino is the dominant hand to Tear Laments Rhino Heart. With this infamous three-pronged whip, he rules over the Tear Laments Shiren, Tear Laments Havness, and Tear Laments Merrily with quite the Iron Fist. When Visas arrives, the Tear Laments monsters explain what had happened to their precious planet. The three aquatic creatures explain that they used to live in harmony, that they used to have fun in the waters, and then Rhino Heart showed up and changed that for the worse. Their guardian, Telemans Kitkolos, wants to work with Visas to take back the land that was once theirs. And so Visas, now understanding the stakes and the destruction that his altar has caused, he is now more motivated than ever to make things right. So Visas heads towards Rhino Heart and confronts him. And just like with Tryheart, Rhino Heart knows what Visas is there for and doesn't want to go back. So the fight begins. As Visas and this sorrowful Rhino Heart fight, the remaining Telemans come to aid in the fight in whatever way they can. However, that backfires as Rhino Heart just sees targets to force Visas out of position. Rhino Heart cracks his whip and each of the prongs heads towards the Telemans. But out of nowhere, Telemans Kitkolos comes to block the blow. Appalled by the audacity to attack the innocent and defenseless Telemans, Kitkolos draws her energy from the other Telemans monsters and musters whatever power she had to take revenge. And she transforms into Telemans Rukolos using the combined power of the Telemans. This is why we see the fusion materials on not only Kitkolos, but also Rukolos being a combination of the Telemans monsters. However, despite the numbers advantage, the fight between Visas and Rukolos against Rhino Heart was no easy feat. The three of them traded blows back and forth. But the injuries that Rukolos took when she blocked Rhino Heart's attack against the Tillaments left its mark. In a decisive but desperate maneuver, Rhino Heart used the power of his whip to absorb the power of Rukolos, turned him into the all powerful Tillaments Kaleido Heart, hence his fusion materials being a combination of Rhino Heart and two Aqua monsters which is meant to represent Rukolos and Kitkolos respectively. All alone, Visa Starfrost stared down this sorrowful altar of his, but he knew Kaleido Heart wasn't in the best state. Despite absorbing Rukolos and taking her power, she was already injured, so Kaleido Heart wasn't too healthy either. So there was hope for Visas to come out on top. Visas, knowing this, charged at Kaleido Heart with full force. With Lightheart's encouragement, Visas had the confidence to take down Kaleido Heart. With a dodge of the whip's prongs here and a dash over Kaleido Heart's tentacles, Visas managed to strike the killing blow on Kaleido Heart. Once defeated, Rukolos was ejected out and Kaleido Heart reverted back to Rhino Heart. The Telemans celebrated their new freedom as anyone would, but Rukolos and Visas were still pretty injured, so they needed a big rest. As Visas headed towards Rhino Heart to reabsorb him, the Telemans took a moment to relax. Then, out of nowhere, an unidentified being in red armored came out of the shadows and attacked the Telemans. With what strength she had left, Rukolos defended the Telemans with all her might. This unidentified creature was Kashtira Unicorn. Once they realized, fear was stricken to the Telemans and even Lightheart too. As Rukolos battled one of the strongest generals in the Kashtira army, she was beginning to hold her own, gaining confidence with each parry and slash. Rukolos saw an opportunity to strike, a clear, critical blow that would not only save her, but the Telemans too. As she lunged for a strike though, a giant hammer came out of nowhere at full force to knock Rukolos clean out. Emerging from the shadows and waiting for the opportunity to strike was Kashtira Ogre, the brute and epitome of raw power of the Kashtiras, and with him, a capsule of some sort, and he would put the capsule to use right away. Visas couldn't stop the Kashtiras from taking away Rukalos as he was too busy reclaiming Rhino Heart. By the time he finished, he saw the Kashtiras leaving with Rukalos through a portal. On the other end, Visas saw the final piece it would seem. A dark, sinister, and hateful gaze pierces through the portal right into Visas' souls. Kashtira Riseheart knows he's next on the block, but he isn't going to let that happen. And just as quickly as the Kashtiras appeared, Kashtira Riseheart scoffs at Visas and closes the portal. Lightheart was justifiably terrified. He told Visas this wasn't his first time encountering the Kashtiras. A long time ago, Riseheart came to Reichphobia to capture Reichhart to try to absorb him. However, thanks to his beast, Riseheart couldn't achieve his goal and he's been biding his time all this while. Although ideally, he would have preferred to capture Rhinoheart, however, Rukolos would make just as good of a power source. Before Visas could avenge Rukolos, Lightheart felt something was wrong with his beast. So he and Visas went back to Reichphobia to check on his pack. But to Lightheart's surprise, his territory was invaded and taken over by the Kashtiras and his beasts, Scareclaw Arco, Bulone, and Astra, were nowhere to be seen. Absolutely shocked, Lightheart burst out into tears and anger for his beast, fearing for the worst. And so, Visas heads towards the planet of the Kashtiras, Wraithsoth. When Visas arrives, it's too quiet. None of the Kashtira generals are present. Even Riseheart is nowhere to be seen. After looking around, Visas finds the central building, and Kashtira Riseheart is there, waiting for him. To his side is the capsule that Kashtira Ogre was holding onto, the one that contained Rukolos. Riseheart explained that he didn't want to go back. 
that he wanted to become his own all-powerful being of anger and rage. Riceheart wants to destroy Visas and absorb his power and become truly unstoppable. After his monologue, he explains he has two presents for Visas, well specifically Reichhardt and Rhinoheart. Riceheart explained that he was quite fond of both Reichhardt's beasts and Rucolos and wanted to add his own touch to them. Riceheart held his hand in front of Rucolos' capsule and began channeling his energies into it, while Visas heard a clawed beast entering the room, and with quite the dramatic and good timing, the capsule opened and the beast entered the room. Tier Limits Kashtira and Scareclaw Kashtira entered the arena, so to speak. Kashtira Tier Limits is the corrupted Rukulos. Now wielding a giant axe, the psychic water level 7 monster enters the fight with 2300 attack and 1200 defense. And in true Tier Limits fashion, her effects are all based around milling cards. She can special summon herself from your hand by banishing a Kashtira or Tier Limits card from your hand or graveyard. Then, if she's normal or special summoned, you mill the top 3 cards of your deck. Her last effect is that if a Tier Limits or Kashtira is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can mill the top two cards of your deck as well. Scareclaw Kashtira is the combination of all the Scareclaw beasts, just like Tryhard's Mount, but with a Kashtira twist. The level 7 Earth Psychic Monster with 0 attack points, but 2600 defense, has three effects. One for each of the beasts that were used to make it. The first is that you can banish a Scareclaw or Kashtira monster from your hand or graveyard to special summon Scareclaw Kashtira from your hand. Then, with its 2600 defense points, it can attack from defense position. Last is that if any of your Scareclaw or Kashtira monsters attacks another monster, you can negate its effects until the end of the turn. Both the new additions to the Kashtira monsters focus mainly on their original archetypes, but with a little hint of Kashtira support. With Tier Limits Kashtira being focused around milling, and Scareclaw Kashtira being focused around beefing up your other monsters while in defense position. However, due to the XE's mechanic that the cash tiers are focused around, it makes sense that all the support the cash tier would have is to get easily accessible bodies in the field for XE's plays. Visas is horrified to say the least, and he's not alone. Rhinohard and Reichhardt are equally mortified to see what's become of their dear companions. And, like a true overconfident supervillain, Reichhardt explains he doesn't need the additional aid of his new companions. That's why none of the other cash tiers are present, or at least in sight. Riceheart wanted to take down Visas with his anger and power alone. And so, Riceheart and Visas charge at each other, and the fight truly begins. The two parts of the same being clash their arms together. On one hand, Visas, the main body, is trying to reclaim the lost parts of himself that he lost, and bring peace to those that his altars have damaged. On the other hand is Kashtira Riceheart, the leader of the Kashtira army, filled with rage and anger, trying to preserve all he has built. As the two clash, surges of energy come bursting out and they both get knocked back with so much force they fly out the main building. Now, on a true battlefield in the middle of the Kashtir base of operations, with Kashtir's Shanger Ra looming in orbit, Riseheart laughs. Riseheart then explains that he's going to show him his true power, and a beam of red energy blasts out from behind the rubble towards the sky, flying down from above as Kashtir of Riseheart. Visas wasn't too surprised as both Rhinoheart and Reichhardt also had power versions of themselves too. So, Visas was sure that if he could take down two versions of his powered up selves, he could take down this last one too. So, the two leapt at each other with their cosmic arms clashing once more. There's destruction everywhere, surges of energy blast out from their battle. And this energy of the collision between the two keeps growing and growing. And then, like a balloon, the energy exploded. The force of the explosion knocked Riseheart clean out of his armor as he couldn't withstand the blast. But on the other hand, thanks to Lightheart and Rhinoheart helping shield some of the blast for Visas, he's able to escape. And just as quickly as the battle started between Visas and Riseheart, it ended. Visas headed over to Riseheart as his armor crumbled, and began to absorb the last fragment of himself. Or at least, the last fragment that he thought he was missing. Lights flares, energy soared as Visas became whole once more. As Visas' memories flooded back in, he realized that there was a secret fourth part of Visas that was out there on Calarium. As Visas understood his next and seemingly final goal, something went wrong. Riceheart's anger was too strong and started to overpower not only Visas but Rhinoheart and Reichhardt as well. Visas all-powerful cosmic armor shattered, with protrusions coming out of his forearm and Visas lost control. He began growing, spikes and claws emerged from all over his body and Visas turned into vicious astral loud. This level 8 dark fairy monster has 3000 attack and defense and requires Visas as well as another monster with 1500 attack and 2100 defense, so one of Visas' variants essentially. And this fusion summon doesn't require a fusion card like Palmerization. Astrolout instead can fusion summon itself by banishing the materials from either your field or graveyard. In pure aggressive fashion, when Astrolout is special summoned, you can target one monster in the field and destroy it. Then Astrolout gains half the attack points of the destroyed monster. The corrupted version of Visas knows his next target. Astrolout blasts off into space, heading towards Galarium, the last world. This peaceful planet is inhabited by the Monodiums. This archetype is pretty small, consisting of 11 total cards. The star of the show, and the last missing piece of Visas, is Monodium Riemhart, 
a light counterpart to the other heart monsters, as it shares the same stat line at level 4, 1500 attack, and 2100 defense. Rium Heart can special summon itself from your hand while you control either Visa Starfrost or one of the altars, meaning a monster with 1500 attack and 2100 defense. Then, simply if Rium Heart is summoned, you can add a Monodium card from your deck to your hand. Speaking of the other Monodium cards, let's go through them. There's the spell cards Monadium Imaginings, Abscission, and Peaceful Planet Calarium. Imaginings lets you reveal either Visa's or Monadium card in your hand, then you can draw two cards. But then you have to place one card from your hand on the bottom of your deck. There's also an additional effect to banish itself to target a monster with 1500 attack and 2100 defense and treat it as a tuner. Monadium Abscission lets you either destroy one monster you control to add the archetypal field spell to your hand, or if you already control the field spell, add another Monadium spell trap card to your hand. You can also banish Abscission to special summon either copy of Visa's or one of its altars from your graveyard. Last in terms of spell cards is the field spell Peaceful Planet Calarium, which on activation lets you add either a copy of Visa's or any Monadium monster to your hand. Then, light monsters gain 100 attack for each tuner you control or that is in your graveyard. Last, if a tuner is destroyed, you can special summon one of them. Although these are all once per turn effects, including the field spell itself, the Peaceful Planet is quite strong. In terms of trap cards, there's Monadium Breakheart, which is an archetype of Monster Reborn, and it lets you target one tuner or one synchro monster in your graveyard and special summon it. Then if it was a light monster, you can destroy one monster your opponent controls with less attack or equal to the special summon monsters. It can also banish itself to protect a Visa's monster, or one with 15 2100 stat line from being destroyed. Last, there's the counter trap Monadium Reframing, which is the archetypal Omni Negate. You need to control a synchro monster to negate the activation, and then you have either Visa's or a monster with 15 2100 stat line on your field or graveyard to destroy the card. It can also banish itself to shovel back three Monadium monsters from your graveyard to your deck. And now to the remaining monsters. I saved them for last with regards to the archetype, as there's a little more to them than just reading their effects. Starting with Manadium Fearless, a level 2 Earth Fairy Tuner. It can special summon itself from your hand if you control a Visa's or a version of him, and if it's destroyed by battle, you can special summon another copy of Fearless from your deck. Additionally, Synchro Monsters gain 500 attack points. Manadium Meek is a level 2 Water Attribute Fairy Tuner that has a very similar effect. It can special summon itself from the hand, just like Fearless, and can special summon another copy of itself if it's destroyed. The only difference in terms of effect is that when another copy is special summoned, you can increase its level by 2. Last of the main deck monsters is Monadium Trid, which is a fire attribute fairy tuner that's also level 2. It shares the same special summoning from the hand effect as the other two, but when it's destroyed, you can special summon any Monadium tuner from your deck. The Monadium tuners should all look familiar, as they all are representations of the altars of Visas and the opposite of the emotions they showed. Fearless is the best example, as it represents the Scareclaw monsters, which are all named around fears and phobias. You can even see little Scareclaw beasts walking around. Meek represents the tier laments and sorrow in the same way. Although you don't see any tier limit monsters in the artwork, there's still all the attributes that are indicative of the archetype. The watery pale rhino in the background, and the character showcasing the colors of the tier laments. Last is Trid, which represents the Kashtiras, showing through the little character in a rice heart like armor and Japanese-style buildings. And the fact that they're all tuners is no coincidence, as we'll soon get into. The Monodiums are the last type of extra deck monster the Visa's archetype revolves around. Scareclaws were Link monsters, Tier Laments Fusion monsters, Cash Tier XC's monsters, and now Monodiums are the Synchro monsters. But we'll save the actual Synchro monsters for when they show up in the story. Calarium is a peaceful world, and it's where Visa's home is. Each of the orbs that the Tuner Monodium monsters are on exists on the branches of the central tree of the world, and it's Visa's duty to protect the tree and the peace of these planets. But now that's threatened. Astrolot arrives, and as he descends down to the last and final piece of himself, he fires a blast from the sky towards Ruimheart, which is shown in the Monadium Obsidian card art. The blasts are raining down in three colors, red for Kashtira, blue for the Telemans, and green for the Scareclaws. Although none directly hit Astrolot's target, Ruimheart suffered some damage nonetheless. Then Astrolot descends from the sky, ready to confront and reclaim the last piece of himself that's been hiding and cowering away. The two engage in a fierce battle, with Ruimheart slashing and firing energy blasts, ripping off and damaging Astrolot's scales, while the Beast of Rage rips and tears Ruimheart. The two go back and forth until Astrolot strikes a finishing blow and knocks Ruimheart down. Laughing at his sealed victory, Astrolot approaches the down Ruimheart. As the Beast raises his bladed arm to strike down and deal the finishing blow, a slash seemingly out of nowhere comes and hits Astrolot from behind. Who could this new ally be? Why, it was Telemant Rucolus. But not the Telemant fusion that we've known, this powered up version is Monadium Trilosucta. Now evolved into a level 6 synchro monster with 2300 attack, 1300 defense, and requires generic materials. On summon, Trilosucta can special summon a level 2 tuner from your graveyard, but its effects are negated. Additionally, once per turn, you can turn all the tuner monsters you control into level 2. With her newfound power, Trilosucta slashes and deals a heavy blow to Astrolout. However, this only grows his rage, and Ruimheart decides to play his trump card and combine with the remaining Monadium monsters. 
the tuners and non-tuners do their thing, and Roomheart reveals his true form, Monodium Prime Heart. This all-powerful level 10 light fairy synchro has a strong 3000 attack and defense, and has several effects. First, it can attack up to the number of tuner monsters used for its synchro summon. Then, if a Monodium tuner was used for its synchro summon, Prime Heart becomes immune to targeted effects. And lastly, if Prime Heart leaves the field, you can either special summon a Visas or one of the altars from your graveyard or if they are banished. With this new dazzling form, Prime Heart leaps to the sky. Astroloud was too distracted to notice as he went to attack Trilasukta from slashing him. From the sky descended Prime Heart with a powerful kick, aiming right in his chest, defeating the Beast of Rage once and for all. As Astroloud gets knocked into the air, the scales and claws of this beast crumble away, and all that remains is Visas, unconscious and slowly descending back down. Retrieving him from his descent was Prime Heart and Trilaxukta. And once more, for the last time, Prime Heart combines with Visas to give him life and make him whole once more, and all seems well. The worlds are at peace and Visas is whole once more. As Visas finally regains his memories of what happened oh so long ago, his fears jump back up once again. What originally caused this massive personality split was due to Visas getting defeated by a powerful foe, Vita Carantha. This level 8 warrior monster with 2500 attack and 2100 defense was the one who caused the splinter in Visas. With his effect, special summon itself when a card is destroyed while you control the Visas, then you can add the field spell Clear New World to your hand from your deck or graveyard. If another monster is destroyed by a card effect, like Astroloud, you can target one monster in the field, destroy it, and Vita Carantha gains attack equal to half their higher stat. And right on cue, the skies darken. Emerging from the sky that's shrouded in purple mist is none other than Vita. Visas was weak after his fight with Astroloud and barely holding on, so he was in no state to fight, nor was he strong enough even in his prime. In an act of desperation, Ryumheart took Visas and threw him back in time before he lost his original fight to Vita before he could be captured. Now, safe from Vita, at least for now, Visas travels far and wide to train so that he will now have a fighting chance against him. Some time passes and Visas train to take down Vita once and for all. While on the other hand, Vita managed to conquer the primeval planets and appoint himself as emperor of the planetary system. His new form, Vita Upanishad, is a level 12 pendulum monster with zero attack and 4000 defense and a scale of zero. The pendulum effect of the new so-called emperor allows it to gain three counters once per chain. Then you can remove 12 counters to special summon him from the pendulum zone, and what's the payoff for the summon? Well, that'll be his monster effect. When it's summoned, which can only be done through its pendulum effect, he is quite the menacing force. Once per turn, when your opponent special summons a monster from the extra deck, you can banish 12 cards face down from your hand, field, or graveyard to change it to the end phase. On top of that, during the standby phase, you can return Vita to your hand in order to special summon any Vita monster, which there is only one, from anywhere to the field. On the other hand, Visas has also grown immensely. He had learned how to balance his emotions and become one with him, turned himself into Visas Amritara. This light warrior tuner synchro monster requires a tuner and a non-tuner as his materials, and shares the name of Visas Starfrost while in the monster zone. When Amritara is special summoned, you can add any spell or trap that mentions Visas from your deck to your hand and you can destroy one monster you control so that all your single monsters gain 800 attack points, bringing Amritara to 3300 attack. With both their newfound powers, the two meet once more for a climactic finale to their story. The two charge at each other with full force. A slash here, an energy blast there, the battle rage as the two were evenly matched. As the two clashed, they wore each other down more and more. Something had to give at one point. Although Vita had time to develop, he was cocky. He focused his time on developing and expanding his empire's rule. While Visas trained and trained, nothing more, nothing less. And so Visas saw a flicker of opportunity, an opening, and without hesitation, he took it. A slash right through Vita was the last thing he saw. With Vita defeated, the world was at peace. Visas went on to restore peace to the worlds that were ravaged by Vita's rule and reconnect with his old friends. Now, with the protection of Visas, the pristine planets Amritara were safe at last. And therein concludes the story of Visas. Yu-Gi-Oh! has been around for over a decade and has released a ton of cards throughout the years. Some of these cards are great, some not so much, and some are right in between. Let's go on an adventure to the unknown side of Yu-Gi-Oh! and find some of the more unique cards in the game. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about counterparts, or at least two archetypes of monsters that have tons of counterparts. The first group of cards in today's episode are the Charmers, and although we've touched on the members of the archetype in previous episodes, but continuing with this episode, we're going to be talking about each Charmer and their companions as they evolve throughout their journeys. And instead of talking about each one individually, we're going to talk about each stage, as the Charmers all go through the same stages. But first, a breakdown of what the Charmers are. The archetype consists of six Charmers and their companions. Each Charmer is based on one of the six main attributes of Yu-Gi-Oh. There's Dark, the Dark Charmer, Asa, the Earth Charmer, Hita, the Fire Charmer, Lina, the Light Charmer, Area, the Water Charmer, and Rin, the Wind Charmer. 
The Charmers at this stage are all level 3, have the same stat line of 500 attack points and 1500 defense, and all have the same effect. When flipped face up, you take control of one monster your opponent controls of the corresponding attribute of the Charmer while the Charmer is on the field. And that's the theme with the Charmer archetype. They can influence other monsters with the same attribute as them. Each of the Charmers have a familiar that, as they get stronger, the familiar also grows with them and shares their powers. All of the familiars, at least in their base forms, are incredibly weak monsters, being all level 3 or lower normal monsters, and except for one case, all with less than 1000 attack and defense. Petit Dragon, Rim's familiar, is the strongest stat-wise of the lot, with 600 attack and 700 defense, just to show how weak they are. However, he to the Fire Charmer's Fox familiar is unique in that it's the only familiar with an effect, which is that during the end phase, if Foxfire is destroyed by Battle and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon it from the graveyard. However, with a caveat that Foxfire can't be used as a tribute summon. So let's just briefly go over each of the Charmer's familiars. Dark has Metabat, Hita has Firefox as previously mentioned, Lina has Happy Lover, Arena has Gigabyte, Rin has Petit Dragon, and Asa has one of the most uniquely named cards in all of Yu-Gi-Oh, Arcfiend Marmot of Nefariousness. As the Charmers continue to develop their powers and abilities, both themselves and their familiars grow stronger. The first stage of this growth is the second form of the familiars. However, not all of the Charmers familiars had the same growth. Not all of the Charmers familiars have different forms. Although there isn't a canonical reason for this, it's more just Dark and Lina were released later on after the four original Charmers. So if you don't see evolutions or stronger forms of Dark or Lina while the others do, that's why. But let's get back on track. So the familiars now have a second form. Foxfire becomes Inari Fire. Gigabyte becomes Gigabyte. Petite Dragon becomes Ranru. And Arcfiend Marmot of Nefarious becomes an even more complicated name, becoming Nefarious Arcfiend Eater of Nefariousness. From there, it's only fair that the Charmers level up as well, becoming their familiar possessed forms. The Charmers channel the power of the familiar into themselves and power up. All of the Charmers in this form are level 4. They all have the same stat line of 1850 attack and 1500 defense, and can be special summoned from the hand or deck by sending the Charmer and a monster of the same attribute to the graveyard. When summoned this way, the familiar possessed monsters also gain piercing damage to their attacks. But, in all honesty, it's a pretty rare case where you'd want piercing damage on a monster with less than 2000 attack. It's also worth noting that both Dark and Lina have an additional effect as they were released later. Lina, when summoned by this effect, can add a monster with 1500 defense from your deck to your hand on top of the previously mentioned effect, while Dark can add a level 3 or 4 light spellcaster from your deck to your hand on top of the other effect. The familiars also have a combo attack so to speak, as seen in their awakening of the possessed forms, which are stronger versions of the base level charmers and feature artwork or combination attacks between the two. These versions of the four main charmers are all level 5 with 2000 attack points. The Awakening of the Possessed Monsters all have essentially the same effect, which is that they can be special summoned from the hand or deck by sending two monsters on the field of the graveyard. These monsters must be one spellcaster and one level 4 lower monster of the attribute of the charmer. Once special summoned by this effect, each one has a unique effect on top of a floating effect to add a spiritual art card or possessed spell or trap from your deck to your hand. The Fire, Water, Earth, and Wind attribute charmers all have one last exclusive form called the Cataclysmic Charmers. These monsters are series level 4 spellcasters that are older versions of the Charmers with their familiars and their non-powered up form. They all have the same stat line of 800 attack and 1500 defense, and have the effect to tribute a monster of the corresponding attribute to special summon a monster of that attribute to your field from your hand. The last of these forms of the channelers are the final forms so to speak, or at least their final forms up till now, which are the Link versions. These versions of the channelers are the most popular and used versions of the channeler cards, as their effects have come a long way since their flip effects. Each one is a Link 2 with both downward pointing diagonal arrows, and requires two monsters to be summoned, with at least one of them being of the corresponding attribute. Like with the other Charmer cards, they all have the same effect, but specific to their attribute. Their effects are that they can target a monster of their attribute in your opponent's graveyard and special summon to a zone that the Charmer points to. Then, if the Link summon card is destroyed in any way, you can add a monster of the same attribute with 1500 defense points or less from your deck to your hand. So despite this simple effect, they are often used against popular decks that share one attribute. The most popular of the Link Charmers is Dark, as a Dark attribute is the most popular attribute of the game, so more likely than not, he'll find usage. It's also worth noting that each Charmer has a Spiritual Art Trap card associated with them, which all have unique effects for the cost of tribute to a monster of the associated attribute. There's Miyabi, which targets cards your opponent controls and places it on top of their deck. There's Greed, which lets you draw two cards, but your opponent can negate it by revealing a spell card in their hand. There's Kurugane, which allows you to special summon a level 4 lower earth monster from your graveyard. There's Kurunai, which allows you to deal damage to your opponent equal to a tribute monster's attack points. Hijiri, which lets you special summon a banished light monster, but like Greed, your opponent can negate it by revealing a trap card in their hand. And last, there's Aoi, which lets you discard a card from your opponent's hand of your choice. 
So despite the Charmers only being six monsters, they have tons of variations and counterparts and have become quite popular. Next up we have the Evil Swarm monsters, which are dark counterparts of various monsters. The Evil Swarm monsters originate in the Dual Terminal arcade game alongside other archetypes like Worms, Gem Knights, Lavals, and Gustos, just to name a few. And where the Evil Swarm monsters come into play is that they are corrupted versions of monsters from the Dual Terminal archetypes, corrupted by the Evil Swarm virus that was released from the Steel Swarm cell. There was only one exception to the Dual Terminal archetypes unaffected by the virus, which were the Violons. Regardless, let's go through each of the Evil Swarms and their counterparts. Starting with Evil Swarm Azathoth, which is based off of the big bad of the first Dual Terminal arc, Worm Zero. Azathoth is a level 4 Dark Reptile monster with 750 attack and 1950 defense, with a flip effect to shuffle a special summon monster back into the deck. Now its counterpart, Worm Zero, is a lot more intimidating. This level 10 Reptile Fusion monster requires two or more Reptile Worm monsters to summon, and has the infamous question mark attack point value. This is because Worm Zero gains both attack points and certain effects depending on the amount of materials used for its summon. In terms of attack points, it gains 500 per material used, and in terms of effects, it gains these effects with certain amounts of materials. With two or more, you special summon a reptile monster face down from your graveyard. With four or more, you can remove from play a reptile monster from your graveyard to non-target send a monster out of the field to the graveyard. And last, with six or more, once per turn, you can draw an extra card. Next up, another boss monster of its original archetype is Evil Swarm Bahamut, and its counterpart, Bryonic Dragon of the Ice Barrier. Bryonic is a level 6 Sea Serpent Synchro monster with 2300 attack and 1400 defense that is generic materials to summon. The pre-errata version of Bryonic was a menace due to its non-once-per-turn effect to return cards to the hand. However, this was changed to its current effect, which allows you to discard a number of cards to target the same amount of cards your opponent controls and return them to the hand. On the other hand, there's Evil Swarm Bahamut, which is a rank 4 Xyz Dragon monster that requires two Elsewhere monsters to summon. With its similar stat line to Bryonic at 2350 attack and 1350 defense, Bahamut can detach material to take control of one of your opponent's monsters by discarding an Elsewhere monster from your hand. On the note of the Ice Barrier monsters, the other dragons of the Ice Barrier, Gungur and Trishula, also become infected with the Evil Swarm virus. Gungir, the level 7 water attribute dragon monster, requires water materials with the effect to discard up to two cards to destroy two of your opponent's cards, turns into the rank 4 Evil Swarm Ophion. This Dark Dragon Exceeds monster requires two level 4 Elsewhere monsters and is great for locking your opponent down. As while it has materials, your opponent can't special summon level 5 or higher monsters. And once per turn, you can detach material to add an Infestation Spell or Trap from your deck to your hand. On the other hand, there's Trishula and its counterpart, Evil Swarm Ouroboros. Trishula, the Dragon of the Ice Barrier, is a level 9 Synchro monster that requires one tuner and two or more non-tuners. Once summoned, you can banish up to one card from your opponent's hand, field, and graveyard. Its counterpart, Evil Swarm Ouroboros, is a rank 4 Xyz monster requiring three level 4 monsters. Ouroboros can detach material to activate one of three effects. The first is to detach material to bounce a card back to the hand. The second is to send a random card from your opponent's hand to the graveyard. And the last is to banish a card from your opponent's graveyard. Next up is Evil Swarm Coppelia, the level 6 Dark Machine monster and its counterpart, Locomotion Argenix. Coppelia has a pretty decent stat line of 2450 attack and 2050 defense, but can't be special summoned. However, its payoff is that when it leaves the field due to an opponent's card, either by effect or battle, you can target and take control one of your opponent's face-up monsters. The inspirations are pretty apparent with its counterpart, Locomotion Argenix, which is a level 9 machine synchro monster that has the effect that when it's synchro summoned, take control of your opponent's monster at the highest level. Pretty simple, yet effective for its time. Next up is Evil Swarm Golem and its counterpart, Ally of Justice Cataster. Both monsters are dark attribute in level 5, but like its Evil Swarm variants, they have 50 less attack points and 50 more defense, putting Golem at 2150 attack and 1250 defense, with Cataster at 2200 attack and 1200 defense. Ally of Justice Cataster was a pretty popular card for the early Seeker era, as it required generic materials and had the strong effect that if it battles a face-up non-dark monster, at the start of the damage step you can destroy the monster making it a powerful option to remove boss monsters. On the other hand, there's Evil Swarm Golem, which is a rock-type monster unlike its machine counterpart, and it can, once per turn, target a level 5 or higher non-dark monster in the field and destroy it. This effect is almost on par with Cataster, and would have been a popular option if it didn't require a tribute to bring it out. On the note of archetypal icons turned Evil Swarm, there's Evil Swarm Thunderbird and its counterpart to Mist Valley Apex Avian. Thunderbird is a level 4 Thunder monster that has the effect that during either player's turn, when an effect is activated, you can banish Thunderbird and special summit during the next standby phase and it gains 300 attack. So, suffice to say, pretty underwhelming compared to its much stronger counterpart, Mist Valley Apex Avian, who is a level 7 winged beast with 2700 attack points that once per chain can quick effect return a Mist Valley card from the field to the hand to negate the effect of a card and destroy it. 
Even if Thunderbird is a lot weaker stat-wise than Avian, it was actually part of a unique deck alongside Windup Rapid in the past that saw some competitive success. Next up is one of the more popular Evil Swarm cards, Evil Swarm Carry Keon, and its counterpart, Constellar Rassel Hage. Rassel Hage is a level 2 light spellcaster monster with 900 attack and can be attributed to special summon a Constellar monster from your hand or graveyard in defense position. Its counterpart is significantly stronger. Now a level 4 dark monster with 1600 attack and 1550 defense, Carry Keon, if sent to the graveyard this turn, allows you to normal summon an Elsewhere monster with one less tribute. On top of that, you can banish an Evil Swarm monster from your graveyard to allow Kiri Keon to gain an additional effect to normal summon an extra Evil Swarm monster this turn. So essentially, Kiri Keon served as a strong extender for the Evil Swarm archetype. Now the monster you've been waiting for, the iconic Evil Swarm Excita Knight. This was by far the most popular of the Evil Swarm monsters, and it was a generic rank 4 Xyz that had a uniquely strong effect being that once per chain during the main or your opponent's battle phase, if your opponent has more total cards in their field and in their hand, you can detach one material to destroy all other cards on the field. So essentially, it was an early version of evenly matched, so to speak. Now, the only drawback was that Excited Knight or any of your other monsters can't deal damage for the rest of the turn. However, that was almost always worth the price. In terms of counterparts, Excited Knight's is Steel Swarm Roach, who is also a rank 4 Xyz monster that requires generic materials, that being two level 4s and had the effect that during either player's turn, when a level 5 or higher monster would be special summoned, you can detach a material to negate the effect and destroy the card. Uniquely, there's actually a third member of this trio, that being Stellar Knight Zephraxiton. This is a level 4 Light Fiend with a Pendulum Scale 7. In terms of effects, the Pendulum effect is the same as the other Zephyr archetypal effects, that being it locks into only Pendulum Summoning Zephyr monsters or Telenite monsters. Its monster effect allows you to a normal flip your Pendulum Summon, target another Zephyr or Telenite monster, as well as one set card your opponent controls and destroy them. Although Zephraxiton is weaker than its counterparts, it still plays a unique archetypal niche. 